Hello and welcome. I'm Steve Clemens, Editor-at-Large of The Hill. Thanks so much for joining us for our forum today called Breaking New Ground, Innovations in Alzheimer's Research. Alzheimer's disease is currently the sixth leading cause of death in the United States. This afternoon, we're going to explore the fight against a disease that takes a crushing toll on patients, their loved ones, and their caregivers. Before we begin, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Eli Lilly, for supporting our conversations, and they're going to be great ones. According to recent data, about 6 million Americans live with Alzheimer's and related dementias, and some estimates predict that num that number could nearly triple over the next four decades. What innovations show the most promise for early detection and treatment? How are researchers better understanding risk factors and diagnoses. Since black and Latino Americans and women are more likely to develop Alzheimer's, how can underserved groups receive equitable access to care, education, and clinical trials? And how can policies prioritize research, awareness, detection, and treatment? We're going to be putting these questions and more in front of our fantastic speakers. But first a, first, a few housekeeping notes. You can tweet us, and I hope you do, at The Hill Events. And the hashtag, more importantly, hashtag is always more important, hashtag The Hill ALZ. We're broadcasting live, and we're going to take your questions throughout the program. As with any live stream, you could experience occasional trouble with the video. I feel like I'm on an airline. Don't throw your computer out the window. Uh, just refresh the page, and that should fix the problem. Before we begin today's program, here's a message from our sponsor, Eli Lilly. I'd like to introduce Ann White, president of Lilly Neuroscience and senior vice president of Eli Lilly. Alzheimer's has affected me very directly. My mom died of Alzheimer's over 10 years ago now. She was the heart and soul of our family. She and I were really close, talked all the time. When my kids were born, my twins, she actually moved in with us to help care for the twins. They were born prematurely. But the fact is that just a few years later, she didn't even recognize her grandchildren. She couldn't remember who they were. I mean, that's how insidious this disease is. Her trajectory of her illness was a tough one. She became very fearful and very agitated. It started with things just as not being able to cook when she used to be an incredible cook, not being able to turn on the TV or the radio and listen to her music but eventually it got very severe where she couldn't take care of herself and she couldn't eat, and eventually she lost her life. But thankfully, even to the end, she recognized me and my sisters. She couldn't speak, but you could see the look in her eye when we come in her room that she recognized us and knew that we were there to take care of her. And when she passed away, I was holding her hand, looking into her eyes, so we took the best care of her we could, but it was a very challenging time for our family, and for those that take care of those with Alzheimer's, they know what I mean, that it's such a challenging disease, and it robs people of so much, especially those precious memories and the relationships uh, with their family. It is really an incredible honor to lead this business unit, to help people with Alzheimer's, so many people are affected globally. It's a huge responsibility. So that's why I'm so inspired that we have to do the work that we're doing to help those patients and those families with, with answers here, because this is a terrible disease. Hi, my name is Ann White, and I lead the neuroscience business here at Lilly. Before turning it over to the industry-leading voices that you'll hear from today, I wanted to reinforce our commitment at Lilly to advancing the science of Alzheimer's disease on behalf of patients and their families. We have been pursuing innovation in Alzheimer's for more than 30 years, investing billions of dollars and countless hours of scientific research, and we have never considered giving up. Alzheimer's disease is the sixth leading cause of death in the United States, and the one with the least progress until recently. The remarkable speed over the recent years was built on the decades of work that went before it. People with Alzheimer's and their families are counting on us to deliver medicines for them. My family's story isn't unique. Millions of people around the world are impacted by Alzheimer's disease. At Lilly, we know that complex problems require a multi-stakeholder approach and Alzheimer's disease is definitely a complex challenge. This is why we wanted to sponsor this Hill event and facilitate this important dialogue, and I'm excited for the variety of perspectives that will be shared today. There are three things I hope we can accomplish. First, we must recognize that we are on the brink of meaningful change for both how we diagnose and how we treat Alzheimer's disease. 
Second, that we identify the changes needed to take full advantage of the potential scientific advances happening now in the field. And third, that we realize the importance of collaboration in making change happen and ensure a continued partnership across all stakeholders into the future. We are motivated to impact the trajectory of this devastating disease and proud of our progress to date. We remain hopeful for patients and their families and believe that we can work together with healthcare providers and policymakers to accelerate both the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease and the potential of innovative treatments to treat, and we hope eventually to prevent it. And with that, let me introduce you to a few of my Lilly colleagues, many who have been working on solutions in this space for decades. When I think about Lilly's commitment uh, to Alzheimer's disease, the word perseverance come to my mind. I think Nini is really committed to leverage the learning and technological advances that will help patients and families affected by this disease. It's been a focus on diagnostics to, to see the pathology of the disease in the brain and a focus on therapeutics that can reverse that pathology in the brain. For the most part, we haven't been distracted from that vision of how we can treat Alzheimer's disease and that's what's starting to pay off now. What a privilege to be here at this moment in time and to be here specifically at Lilly with such a storied past in Alzheimer's disease, 30 years of a commitment there, and with each negative study, so not failed study, but negative study, there was a pearl of wisdom that was gained and then integrated into the next study. We haven't given up because we know that we're just learning more and more with each step. We've worked really hard to design trials that are more robust. We could do that because of our investment in enabling technologies and biomarkers and imaging and blood tests, the things that we've pioneered over decades, tools that we've created just to let us ask the, the right questions. We've been making great progress on understanding the pathologies and Lily's been the leaders in that progress. And all of that comes from all those failures and all that data that we've generated over the period of time to help us come up with good diagnostic criteria and ability to identify the right people. I think it's very important that we're keeping diversity and inclusion in the forefront as we're creating our clinical trials and recruiting for them as we're thinking through commercialization strategies and taking all of that into account so that we're able to meet those patients and caregivers and physicians, frankly, where, where they are. It's easy to think of the reason to keep working on Alzheimer's. It's the people that are suffering because of this terrible disease with really no progress in, in treatment. It's, it's our parents and grandparents and friends and, and family members. So because it's so hard and because there's been so little progress, that's the reason we keep working on it. Thanks again to Ann White and to Eli Lilly. And I, I should mention about Eli Lilly, I've interviewed Dave Ricks, the CEO of Eli Lilly, editorially. Uh, and in all the good ways, I know that he and his company are really obsessed with this topic and moving the needle on it. So thanks so much for setting the stage for today's important conversations. My first guest is Congressman Paul Tonko from New York. He's a good friend of the Hill. He sits on the Congressional Task Force on Alzheimer's Disease, and he's made Alzheimer's care a legislative priority of his. Uh, Representative Tonko, great to see you again. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, let me just ask. It's good to join of, you, Steve. Let me just ask you an out of left field question. I was, you know, up there, not in the hall, but you know, in the hallways, interviewing uh, folks like yourself, your colleagues, after the State of the Union address, and it occurred to me when President Biden talked about the cancer moonshot, whether or not, right. given the fact that Alzheimer's is the most expensive disease in America in terms of its economic uh, impact on Americans, why not have a Alzheimer's Mars shot? You know, um, and a good idea, really. I think also we heard in the president's message that America is seen in his vision as um, a country that is about possibilities. And so I think any of these possibilities, like those that come with research, with Alzheimer's, um, there's great potential. And we have the intellectual capacity as a nation uh, and the will, I believe, to invest in that, that uh, we certainly could um, advance that sort of effort, but I think there's a lot going on and we're gonna to continue to fight for research dollars, uh, especially through my 
assignment on energy and commerce, I want to make certain that we don't fall backward on research, but that we only continue to add to the uh, efforts to uh, get to that point of discovery as soon as we can, because it's important to do from a humanitarian aspect um, to make certain that our loved ones who struggle with this disease and the ripple effect on the family and friends and caregivers is real. And uh, beyond that, it extracts a huge cost financially uh, for budgets, household budgets, and certainly government budgets. So uh, we need to conquer this. Let me ask you, Paul, I, you know, later in the program, I'm going to be talking to a lot of my friends because I've been doing um, conversations on Alzheimer's now, it seems, for decades. And one of my good friends, George Vradenberg, who's been at this for a long time, as you know, is going to be in this. And, and I guess the questions I'm going to have for a certain number of people is, are we at an inflection point in your gut? Or is this, you know, we have a lot of resources in this. Maybe we need more. We have a lot of science focused on it. The president talked about an ARPA-H, you know, bringing folks in. We have a lot of uh, efforts around therapies and patient support and trying to change the dynamics for those living with dementia. But I'm just trying to kind of get a feel whether we're deluding ourselves right. and thinking we're at a moment of inflection or whether you really feel as if the vectors are crossing in a constructive way. Yeah, no, I think there's a confluence here. And I think that inflection point is coming. You know, I, I watched with interest and, uh, uh, and heartache as I watched Anne's presentation in, uh, with her case, uh, with her, her mom. And uh, over 10 years, I think we've made great progress. And so that inflection point is coming. Uh, the Aduhelm news of late uh, with its approval with FDA uh, and now CMS uh, responding with a proposal for coverage um, tell us that we're getting to uh, to that advanced point where there's more hope in the air and that's what this is all about making certain that we provide hope for our, for our individuals living with Alzheimer's and dementia uh, and their family and circle of friends so we want to provide that hope and and make that discovery as soon as possible. And I think uh, we are at an inflection point to answer your question. Now, so you and uh, uh, Representative LaHood have written to Secretary Becerra at Health right. and Human Services and said, there's a part of this game, uh, part of this equation right now you're not happy with. Can you tell us more? Sure. Um, my friend and colleague, uh, Congressman LaHood from Illinois, a, a Republican and myself as a Democrat, offered a bipartisan letter over to uh, HHS and uh, expressing concern that, um, that there needs to be perhaps alternatives so that the proposal would evaluate other ways to uh, make certain that we provide better outreach. My concern is that here we have an FDA approval that has met with the efficacy and safety standards, uh, but that coverage may limit it to a very few. Um, with the coverage with evidence development requirements, there might be a lack of access, it might be restricted to folks who are in proximity uh, of these, uh, of these uh, 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 testing opportunities or who have the affordability. And I think that you know what the work here is all about is reaching to a, a, a very vast and diverse audience of individuals and families that are faced with this struggle. And we wanna make certain that that hope is spread across a large audience. My concern with the coverage with evidence development is that it may restrict that and may create a precedent so that as you have this grouping, all of these efforts, these successes or trial runs going forward are going to be grouped in a way that will provide these restrictions and not allow for the, its benefits and its hope to be realized. What do you think are some of the other missing planks as you look at it from a public policy perspective? Um, my understanding is that you've been very supportive of something called the Comprehensive Care for Alzheimer's Act. Has that passed yet? Is that in motion? Uh, nope. What would be the it's, dimensions it's of it you in, think are important? Right, we introduced it uh, this year um, and in this session, I should say. And uh, you know, we're garnering support, we're getting sponsors and making certain that as we go forward, that uh, we provide for the kind of solid response to to this effort, to this, uh, to this illness. It's important for us to, I believe, provide for a comprehensive strategy. Uh, we have to keep in mind, uh, Steve, that 95%, it's, it's estimated, of individuals with dementia have one or more other chronic conditions. 
And uh, that might include hypertension or heart disease or diabetes. And we want to make certain that these medical complications uh, are addressed in a way that provides greater coverage uh, for dementia care through Medicare, making certain that these different disciplines um, are talking to each other in the medical community, that we're putting together efforts so that we reduce hospitalizations and emergency department visits and delay nursing home placement so that it speaks to the quality of life for the patient and makes treatment all the more affordable. So, you know, I think that comprehensive strategy is important. Um, it, we look at the uh, millions of Americans who are faced with these struggles. And uh, I think it's time for us to really provide for that coordination of care in, in a more holistic and collaborative model. Look, I'm not one who believes, I used to work as a staff member in the Senate and I used to be uncomfortable when sometimes um, we would engage uh, support in, in health advocacy efforts because of the personal stories our member had or the connection. But now I see it's really important, but it's really important to bring other people in that conversation. Now, Alzheimer's is out there, and, and, I, and I imagine that if people scratch uh, in their family a bit, everybody has exposure and connection to this, but there's somehow a stigma, it's somehow pushed to the side, somehow not. But, but Paul, I'd be interested in you sharing why this became such an important cause for you. What the human side of the policy sure. interest you have, and how when you talk to colleagues that may not be as animated as you've been in supporting Alzheimer's, how do you bring them over into the conversation? I think in one word, storytelling. Mm. You know, uh, my connection to this is through family and friends who have faced this uh, challenge. Um, and you really seem to lose your loved one. Uh, they become someone else. Uh, and you also then mourn twice well, when they're first diagnosed and then uh, with their physical passing. And so I share stories. I think it's the best way to advocate for um, the reforms we need, for the resources we require. Um, I think those efforts are the best. And um, again, if that doesn't reach from a human, human, humanitarian effort, if you can't reach them uh, in that compassionate or empathetic uh, model, then move to the, uh, the price tag. And we have to do something to go forward and conquer this with huge investments up front to save us as we go down the road. You know, when I first got involved with carrying a lot of legislation for the Alzheimer's Association, which I re totally respect their leadership, their volunteers, their ambassadors. But um, I got involved with that effort and we were able to successfully achieve um, a, a push for the Alzheimer's Accountability Act, Steve. And that act enabled us to get a good clinical response for a budget that was created for us to uh, respond to this disease. Um, what we did was make certain that it was clinicians numbers and not those coming from political forces that uh, put that budget together with a goal of 2025. Hmm. Now, we've made great strides. We've had those benefits of a clinical budget, but we have a lot farther to go. Uh, we've done a lot of legislation that, uh, again, involves the families, the, the ambassadors of Alzheimer's Association reaching to us and sharing with us. Um, and I think some of the strongest impact, impact comes from early diagnosed individuals who will reach out to you and share with you what they have lost in the early stages. And that heart-wrenching uh, exchange uh, can't help but reach uh, the individual that has the role of fighting for legislation and, uh, and putting together a federal budget as a response. Listen, just you know, back to this um, CMS question that you've written about. I have tried sure. this last week to find people on the other side of this argument. If anybody's there, send me a note. I haven't found a single person or an institution that thinks this decision is a smart one uh, in terms of uh, uh, the divisiveness of the payment direction at this important moment, that the first time in 19 years you have a drug that's provisionally a a approved. Um, I guess my question to you is, you know the system better than I do. What does it take to get that decision reversed? Is it an arbitrary decision, a subjective decision by an administrator? Is it something that can be done legislatively? How do you get a reversal of that decision if, if, if so much of the world wants it? Right. Well, combating the amyloids that are the, the core focus here in terms of treatment for Alzheimer's 
is important. And I think some of the early legislation now, or excuse me, the development of pharmaceutical, early pharmaceuticals here with uh, the Biogen effort for um, the beginning sake here. Um, I think that, you know, with their process coming up in mid-April, where they're going to um, uh, make a final decision, we want to make certain that every voice is heard here in terms of concern. And again, it's the audience of participation, uh, the audience of, of help uh, that will uh, be realizing the benefits of this drug and then the precedent setting. So I think most people understand that uh, they want hope to be stretched to as many uh, individuals as possible. And they want to make certain that, uh, you know, that uh, uh, with the approval of FDA, that there's a good way to um, uh, address accessibility um, and affordability. And this is about coverage. You know, I think people understand that the coverage issue uh, is important, uh, as is that FDA step in the process of determining efficacy and safety. Yeah, well, look, you have our great thanks, uh, as always, for coming to talk to us about important policy issues. This is our first time on this topic. You discussed so many other issues uh, in your world. But uh, Paul Tonko uh, from uh, Ohio, thank you so much. Member of the Congressional Task Force on Alzheimer's Disease, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure, Steve, and thank you for your good work. I'm pleased to welcome my next guest, Dr. Elias Zerhouni, who served as the director of the National Institutes of Health under President George W. Bush. He now joins me to discuss the need for innovation and collaboration in the fight against Alzheimer's. Dr. Zerhouni, it's always great to talk to you. And I guess as I just introduced you, I said the need for innovation and collaboration. We could have been saying that for 20 years. So mm -hmm. my unfair question to you is, what do we need? This is like one of the biggest ailments facing Americans, like number one, like top of the charts. I, I just want to get your playbook on how we dent this. Well, you know, my observation is that many people are trying and there are many efforts and, but most of those efforts, in my opinion, are subscale and subcritical and many of them are overlapping. And it's, it's, it's the image I use is that having like 10, 10 foot ladders to try to climb a 100 foot high wall will not get you over the, hall, the wall. So it's better to build and collaborate and, and try to build a 100 foot ladder to climb that extraordinary high wall that we have to face in Alzheimer's disease. And that was the idea that I pushed, if you will, because my observation was that many of the studies that are done, not just in the US, but worldwide, are primarily on Caucasian populations. We don't have a global perspective on the disease. We really don't understand the heterogeneity of this disease. And so my view is that innovation should actually be based on synergy of collaborations around the world to build what I call the, the Alzheimer cohort, uh, which the, um, you know, the Davos, Davos Alzheimer Cooperative is trying to build uh, uh, worldwide, and this is something that I think is needed. It's a little bit like the Framingham study for heart disease. We wouldn't have made the progress we made in heart disease without the Framingham study. I am dreaming of the same thing for Alzheimer's disease. So, Dr. Zerhouni, what are the barriers to that? I mean, I, I'm just there thinking, you're an expert, I'm a layperson in this, but um, for instance, in COVID, uh, or dealing with pandemics or viruses that are hitting the world, not just one country within borders. Um, I was, I've interviewed several times Richard Hatchett, who's head of the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations to sort of look at global response. The, why wouldn't we have what you're suggesting? I'm su surprised we haven't had it. What are the barriers? Well, I think the barriers are first the issue that you face when you have a dominant um, um, hypothesis, uh, the A-beta hypothesis, that has sort of shifted the whole world towards that effort. And many, many uh, companies, many uh, academics have sort of staked their lives on that hypothesis. I think we need to open the aperture. We really need to understand better the fundamental mechanisms of the disease, which we cannot do without comparing and contrasting what happens in a population that's different than ours in different parts of the world, in different environments, that knowledge is not there. Uh, there have been some efforts. I mean, NIH with the AMP uh, trials and Alzheimer has pushed the envelope, if you will, by 
collating all the information that companies have and academics have to try to find new new clues to the disease. There are over 50 hypotheses right now about why the disease develops. We also understood that you needed to, disease, to detect the disease much earlier than we did before. And we tried. I mean, the NIH had the, um, uh, the trials on Alzheimer's disease uh, neuro initiative and the imaging uh, and the biomarkers that have come up. We think, I think we are frankly facing organizational issues. The sources of funding are different. They're not necessarily co coordinated and we need to do that. And this is what this initiative that we're, we're promoting is hopefully going to do for us. You know, there, there's finally been, after nearly 20 years, a new drug, I may be pronouncing it wrong, Aduhelm, that has been conditionally approved by the Food and Drug Administration. There's some confusion over, you know, I think about how, uh, uh, who would be covered into this. So this, you know, Center for uh, Medicare is saying, we're, we're gonna, CMS is gonna uh, fund it for those patients in clinical trials, not funding those or not. So there's a little bit of wobbliness in this and, and controversy, but I'd be interested in kind of your gut feel on the FDA decision and whether it's showing, I, I, I guess, you know, you gotta see where the science is and the research and public safety, but do you feel like the door is finally opening on some approvals after a very long period of nothing? Well, it is because there was a long period of nothing that the bar was changed and the risk benefit calculations that the FDA did were different than what it would have been if we had multiple drugs available. It's a very different context because you have no alternative. And so the FDA wanted to take the, the accelerated approach, uh, um, conditional approval approach, which is a tried and true approach when you have uh, therapies that are not yet proven, but need to be available. Uh, on the other hand, it's controversial because at the end of the day, there's not enough safety data. Uh, a lot of the analysis was post hoc. And so many scientists uh, feel that the evidence is not strong enough. And then you get these reactions from CMS and others to try to limit uh, the use of the drug and the cost of the drug. But from my point of view, you know, I think there is a, a, a void. There is a, a problem uh, on the policy uh, level of what happens between a drug that is given conditional approval and its market use. I think we need to, to really focus on that and come up with different ideas. I have, I have my own and, and I don't know that they will be accepted, but I really think that what I call progressive approval is a better strategy. We, I talked to the EMA and the EMA is following a little bit of that approach, but I think the US does not have that policy instrument to bring together to the table in a, in a controlled manner. That's really the, 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 the gap that I see that is leading us to this complicated uh, situation between adult helm being approved or not approved and, and you know paid for or not paid for. So there is a void, there is something that we need to work on. Um, you know, ideas have to be put on the table, but my own idea is that we need to do a phased approval, progressive approval with increasing larger number of patients under surveillance, obviously, for side effects and then decide if there is a full approval. You know, as, as we see a leadership now, uh, change now coming at the NIH, you used to run this place, is, is it time to begin looking at a field like this and, and asking some fundamental questions, which I know you've been suggesting, about how the NIH leverage in the process can be shifted? Um, and I guess the question I have, just listening to you and reading some of your comments, do we need to de-silo some of this research, de-silo some of the approach? Absolutely, I think the silo uh, that you describe, the silos that you describe, are really a problem in, in some ways, um, but, but you can't really, you can really do it at the basic level, right? The basic level to me, the discovery has to be investigator initiated, we have to have these, ideas tried in various uh, aspects. Diversity enhances discovery. Hmm. However, when it comes to applying what we know or what we think we know, you really need to get critical mass. You need to get a scale that today I don't think is achieved. And I think that's what the NIH should really uh, support, the at scale 
um, critical mass trials uh, in collaboration with others around the world, if need be, to try to to try to implement what we have already done. In other words, we have digital biomarkers, we have blood biomarkers, we have genomics. That has never been integrated in a comprehensive fashion. And that's why I think what you're saying is, is appropriate. We need to really step back and say, okay, what can we do better? That's fascinating. I had I had no idea that that you know you're, you're basically saying we've we've leaped forward in many areas of science, but back at the mothership, it hasn't been integrated. Is, am I getting that right? Pre, uh, yeah, pretty much. I mean, it's not like they they have not tried. I mean, if you see some of the cohorts that NIH is funding, they've made some fundamental advances. I mean, hmm. you know, the the, the 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 studies, for example, of. Uh, brain samples, uh, that is very informative. Uh, the study of immunology and the relationship of immunology and Alzheimer's disease, inflammation, Alzheimer's disease. We have a tremendous amount of progress. I don't think all of that has been integrated in a way that at least will give us the same power that we were able to put together with the Framingham study, where we discovered many of the disease um, uh, markers, the, uh, the the risk factors, and we managed to reduce the mortality of, of heart disease by two thirds. Uh, that's what I'm hoping for in Alzheimer's disease, ways of following the patient with digital biomarkers, with their smartphone, understanding the evolution of the disease. Why are people, some people, uh, progressing much faster than others? What's protecting the ones that would not, not advancing? That research needs to be done, but it needs to be done at scale and, and, and with critical mass. And let, let me ask you finally, and this question is a little close to the editorial edge, because I'll tell folks, you know, Eli Lilly is sponsor of this, Eli Lilly is making big in, investment in this. Um, and I am very happy that they're asking this question because Eli Lilly has invested billions and billions of dollars. They actually made a movie, which I applauded, on um, a very promising drug that failed. And in the end, it, 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 it failed. It did not meet its clinical endpoints at trial. And so, you know, I've always thought since watching that film, it's good for the public to know that there are failures in the research process again. But do you worry, how is our infrastructure and our relations between the FDA, the research, the NIH, uh, private firms uh, in, in proceeding? Because I worry after 20 years of there being very little advancement that companies will just you know, pick up their, their um, resources and walk another direction. I just don't believe that. I mean, I know the industry, I know government, I know academia. I don't feel that if, if given a good hypothesis with hmm. good preclinical data and cohort data that says, you know, what, what you're going after is validated from the clinical point of view, uh, that uh, firms will hesitate to invest. They have done it. The problem we had is we were blinded by a very dominant uh, hypothesis that fixing A beta would be the endpoint that you need to go, just like fixing cholesterol, uh, low-density low cholesterol for, for heart disease. So, so, the, so I think the evolution is, is ongoing. I don't see a, a reluctance to um, invest in this field. After all, the reward would be enormous if we could do it, both in terms of public health as well as in terms of revenues for the industry, if they are justified by solid trials that really are going after a supported hypothesis by the on the ground clinical genomic uh, blood marker information, biomarker information that I think is lacking. Um, I can't predict right now very, very accurately who is going to develop the disease so that you can intervene early because the one thing we've learned is if you intervene too late, uh, the recovery is unlikely. So to me, Eli Lilly and other companies are doing the right thing. I think experimenting and approaching the new world of Alzheimer mechanisms hmm. is something that will require diversity of approaches and a commitment. But I think we shouldn't see, you know, academia separate from government, separate from industry, or, or U.S. separate from the rest of the world. It really requires a, a global effort. Well, that is so heartening to hear. I always love when I have like a biopharmaceutical, biopharmaceutical research set of questions. I always want to talk to you. You really uh, set me straight, and I'm, I'm grateful to hear that you think the pieces are in place. And, and, and we, just, we just need to begin to shift and keep this thing uh, moving in towards new hypotheses and check them out, uh, throw them up uh, for public scrutiny. And 
uh, all of the issues of how science ad, uh, advances and works. Thank you, Dr. Elias Sarhuni, former director of the National Institutes of Health under President George W. Bush. Really great, grateful for your time. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. To further explore some of the innovations on the horizon for Alzheimer's care, I'm really pleased to welcome my next guest, Dr. Maria Carrillo, the Chief Science Officer of the Alzheimer's Association. Dr. Carrillo, it's great to be with you. Look, I just want to get to the bottom line here. You, you raise a lot of money, you spend a lot of money, you see who's got the good ideas, who's got the bad ideas. What are the most promising innovations in Alzheimer's uh, research uh, uh, therapies care that you see out there right now? Well, great to be with you and uh, great to hear so much of this discussion. It's just fantastic. So thank you for that as well. You know, I, I'll say that, first of all, the emerging areas of research are uh, on the horizon and it is such an exciting time for the field. But a lot of this is actually thanks to bipartisan congressional leaders that include Senator Blunt, who I think you're going to have uh, talking with you today, because all of this hinges on increases in funding, federal funding for Alzheimer's and related dementia. And today we are, again, thanks to this leadership, uh, we are at $3.2 billion. The federal commitment has been fantastic and we hope to see that even grow in this coming um, uh, finalized 22 budget. So thanks to Congress for focusing on this. A lot of the things that you've heard already in terms of advancements in other diseases have been made possible because of these federal investments. And of course, you've already talked about the accelerated approval uh, by the FDA of, uh, of this new treatment. That actually is going to create an incredible innovation. I know this is only mm. one drug and it is an accelerated approval and firsts are never perfect. They are uh, quickly though followed by increased investment that we're already seeing happening in the field including, of course, with other disease uh, proteins that we're chasing, like tangles, like inflammation that you've just heard about. So there is so much out there. Now, I'll tell you that one of the biggest things that we also have besides treatment is certainly biomarkers. And you've heard also this discussed as well. One of the most key innovations is being able to detect Alzheimer's early in blood. That mm. has been the holy grail for some time. and. Maybe if you would have asked me five years ago whether this was even possible and when, I would have said it's like a 10-year horizon or more wow. because it's a bit difficult to measure tiny, tiny proteins many, many times removed from the original source, which is the brain. But today with technology improving just in general, it they are on the horizon within the next few years, if not less. That will again innovate our field and enervate our field. So that create, I mean, that blood test sounds so interesting and so around the corner. And then getting back to what Elias Serhunis was talking about, uh, essentially changes the way you can, you can create cohorts. You can, you, you've got just a bigger field to play with, I assume, data sets. Am I getting that right? Yes, and it's really a combination of sort of clinical trials being faster right. and cheaper. Cheaper. Imagine when you don't have to pay perhaps a $5,000 PET scan to demonstrate that a person has amyloid in their brain or even tau in their brain, right? That's even more expensive. And instead, you can do that with a blood test. That is incredible. And that is happening now. And certainly, Eli Lilly is among one of those that is uh, pursuing that. But other companies as well are pursuing this now as a, an experiment. And we hope that that becomes even stronger in the future. But the other side of this is the clinic. Imagine if in the clinic right now, we can't do that. But when we have more, even more therapies approved by the FDA, we will need a faster way to diagnose people. Hmm. And that blood test is again, that holy grail on the clinical side. You know, last night, uh, when we were up at the uh, State of the Union, uh, fun around around everything going on. I was listening for President Biden's comments about health. And in it, he said, uh, ARPA, he says, uh, to get there, I'm gonna call on Congress to fund ARPA-H, the Advanced Research Project Agency for Health. It's based on DARPA, the Defense Department project that led to the internet, GPS, and so much more. ARPA-H will have a singular purpose to drive breakthroughs in cancer, Alzheimer's, diabetes, and more, a unity agenda for the nation. How big a step is that? How promising is is it for those um, that are deeply uh, invested in advances in Alzheimer's research? 
So I think that, you know, this is again, uh, another nod from our federal government acknowledging the challenges that we face in solving the Alzheimer's problem. We were, um, and I myself uh, participated in a panel with Dr. Francis Collins when uh, we were exploring um, this potential uh, ARPA H uh, framework. And I think it is very important because it again, gives us a different way to focus on the research. Kind of, a, you heard a little bit from uh, Dr. Zerhouni talk about the, 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 all of the pluses and, and minuses around NIH funding. You know, the, the ARPA models uh, really do away with a lot of that because they allow the freedom of, of focus uh, and of putting together um, A teams that can um, really uh, through task force work, get down, roll up their sleeves and find out what needs to be accelerated today. And that's really going to be, I think, another important contributor. And we're looking forward to working potentially with that, that program. You know, I always love talking to Dr. Zerhouni and Francis Collins, who I've had a lot of um, opportunities to talk about, because you learn a little bit more about the nitty gritty of science and the, the battles. But, you know, I remember being in college when I read Thomas Kuhn's book, uh, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. And when you listen to Dr. Zerhouni right now, he's basically, his assertion is that there has been a blinding dominant hypothesis that got in the way of other things. Do you agree with that? And, and, and what's the state of the field now? Is there more of a free market of, of, of compelling um, hypotheses that, that may drive new avenues of science? I don't even know if I'm asking the question correctly, but he was so focused on a hypothesis getting in the way. And he was also basically saying, and I'm going to put words in his mouth, that there was a kind of national narcissism in this, that, that it may be not mm -hmm. intentional, that we weren't, didn't have open apertures to what was going on internationally. And so just from a healthy yeah. science perspective globally, where are we? Well, I, I have to say that it, from my take and from where I sit, um, I don't see it exactly in that way. I think it's, um, I, I can see why you can draw that conclusion, but let me share with you my thoughts. First of all, amyloid uh, plaques and tau tangles are the hallmark of Alzheimer's. They, they, they are. And then they were discovered by Dr. Alzheimer's, claimed as such. And for over 100 years, you know, until we had better technology, they were what we knew about. And so it is clearly going to be the lowest hanging fruit combined, amyloid plaques and tau tangles. It just so happens that amyloid plaques outside of the neurons are a little mm. bit easier to target. So you always go with sort of a, what, what is a little bit easier and it became perhaps the, that catch word, right? Amyloid plaques. And so I can see why people would think that this is this dominant theory. If you're not following it, you're, you're, you're not gonna get funded or you're not gonna get your treatments anywhere. Now, a part of that could have been also that for a decade and a half, if not more, two decades, the National Institutes of Health were funding Alzheimer's to $450 million a year only. Hmm. You can imagine that when you're funding a disease or diseases with that small amount per year that only changed about seven or eight years ago, hmm. that that would create a, an intense competition and perhaps those theories that were more advanced in the process of scientific discovery were the ones that were getting propagated. That is why the Alzheimer's Association wrote and helped pass the bill, the National Alzheimer's Project Act, and why we're working so hard now with, again, with Senator Blunt and other champions to get that funding to a place where it is commensurate with the need. And that is currently happening, 3.2 billion. That is more commensurate and today we are chasing, as you said, these different treatments, inflammation, metabolic function, brain cell health. We ourselves are getting in the game with the Alzheimer's Association's innovative part, the cloud global funding program. We've got 60 clinical trials we're funding. Just hmm. again, only 2% of those are amyloid or tau. We are trying hmm. to chase that full spectrum of Alzheimer's because we understand that Alzheimer's is not just amyloid plaques and tau tangles today. It is a heterogeneous disease with multiple causes and multiple contributors. And to really cure this disease, we're gonna have to go after all of them. We're gonna have to measure Maria and what proteins are going wrong here. And we will be able to address each and every one of them uniquely with personalized medicine approach. That's our future. 
You know, the interviews I love most, Maria, are the ones where I can feel through the screen someone's obsessions uh, to win and to get ahead. I really appreciate it. We're taking uh, questions from the audience. If, we, if We'll squeeze in a quick one uh, for you, if you wouldn't mind. We have uh, Monica Coleman. Monica? I'm Monica Coleman, CEO and president at Inside Capitol Hill. And my question is, can these breakthroughs be applied to other forms of dementia and brain disorders? Thank you, Monica. That's a great question. Can these breakthroughs be applied? So certainly anti-amyloid treatments, let's just take that as an example, may be able to be applied to other dementias that actually also have amyloid plaques as contributors. One of the clear examples is Down syndrome. Now here we have to pause and say, that we need to learn how to crawl before we run. So right now testing all of these things around monoclonal antibodies against amyloid plaques is key so that we can understand all of the safety issues that could surround them. And, and especially in considering, for example, let's just use Down syndrome as an example. Down syndrome individuals, don't, although they do have an abundance of amyloid plaques in their brain that contribute potentially to dementia as they age, because now they're living longer and, and having amazing, fulfilling lives, we know that they also have increased cardiovascular risks. It's mm. just a part of that syndrome. So we need to be careful because we can't today just apply amyloid, you know, adjuhelm or other monoclonal antibodies against amyloid plaques to this other disease until we test it a little bit more carefully. But in the future, that is absolutely the case. We just need to be proceed with caution and adequate testing. Well, Dr. Maria, uh, Dr. Maria Carrillo, Chief Science Officer of the Alzheimer's Association, I love this conversation. I'm obsessed with science broadly. I hope you'll come back when we're not only talking about Alzheimer's, but science in general, because I'm interested in the connectivity of research and health and science. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Discovering breakthrough therapies for Alzheimer's requires investment, and here to discuss what the future may hold for Alzheimer's research is Brent Vaughn, CEO of biotech startup Cognito Therapeutics. Brent, you have been in this uh, business for a while. You're in the private sector side of this. I'm so pleased we get a chance to talk to you. Tell us about your, uh, I'm, I'm reading right now about positive phase two results from uh, a device delivered Alzheimer's. Tell, tell us how you're seeing what is, what is really changing in the Alzheimer's terrain. Yeah, thanks so much for having having me on today. Um, it's it's an exciting topic and obviously a huge unmet need. You know, I think that just just building on some of the comments from the last two speakers, right? You know, we increasingly understand that Alzheimer's is a is a very heterogeneous um, disease. Um, we see it. Uh, we see multiple different therapeutic platforms now that are going forward to try to really start to move the needle here. And I think there's been huge focus, um, rightfully so on antibody-based therapies. Um, the Biogen drug, Adjahelm, Lilly, one of the sponsors for this events, has um, their denanumab drug that has um, been granted breakthrough designation and is going forward. And I think that one of the things that we think is exciting is that there is a whole new category of therapeutic interventions. And we're lucky enough to be leading the charge in this space, looking at non-pharmacological ways of actually being able to try to uh, move the needle and and change the the outcomes for alzheimer's patients you know, I, I guess the other thing i would ask for you is when you kind of look at the broad uh side of therapies that are coming online are there things that the policy community should be doing are there missing gaps in funding that you think are very key to kind of continue to have the you know we just talked to dr carrillo and she's she was praising roy blunt who i understand roy blunt is going to be on talk to me later as a good friend you know move the the funding level of this from 600 million dollars under his tenure to now above three billion dollars but but are the right parts of this puzzle being funded that make it um i guess i, I don't i hate the word safe but make it easier for the private sector to do what you're doing? You know, I think it's increasingly moving in the right direction, right? I think, um, you know, oftentimes in the private sector, maybe we don't give enough credit to where, um, where government and legislative bodies are actually doing the right things. I think the breakthrough designation is a perfect example of that. Um, here at Cognito, we were, we were granted breakthrough designation for our non-pharmacological platform to slow the progression and treat Alzheimer's disease. And so that is similar to the breakthrough 
designation that Lilly received for Denanumab. And so I think when you see when you see breakthrough designation being used and being, I think, used quite correctly in this space, the the criteria for breakthrough with the FDA are a novel therapy um, that addresses an unmet medical need that has chronic or debilitating consequences. And so these are it's a it's a great avenue and a great tool that that the FDA has made available. And so I think being able to have more companies or more therapeutic approaches like ours, um, more therapeutic approaches like what Lilly has, being able to move down the breakthrough path, I think that's quite helpful because ultimately we're quite aligned. We're trying to get safe and effective treatments into the hands of more patients sooner. And so I think that you know certainly we could do more in this space. It is one of the largest unmet medical needs and continues to grow. Um, both in the U.S. as well as other countries. And so um, more off obviously helps, but given the, the heterogeneity of what we see in this, you know, in this disease that the last two speakers have spoken about, right. um, being able to look at different therapeutic modalities at, at Cognito, instead of looking at antibodies like Lilly and Biogen and some of the others, we actually are really trying to, to turn the space on its head a little bit, if you would. Mm. When we look at the brain, we understand that electricity is the fundamental currency of the brain. And when we look at Alzheimer's, we see very pronounced um, disruption in electrical activity across the brain. And so we've decided to take at this from a very different approach. Instead of giving drugs that change A beta and other protein pathologies, um, and then ultimately wanting to see that um, matriculate into changes in electrical activity and outcomes, we, we come at it from the other end. We actually look at some of the areas of brainwave activity that seem to be missing or depressed in Alzheimer's patients. And we've shown that we can modulate or augment that and that that in turn pushes at this disease from the other side and starts changing some of that protein pathology. And in our phase two data, it's shown that in our phase two studies that these patients had a much, much slower rate of progression for Alzheimer's disease. Let, let's bracket the FDA question because I, I received a, from a knowledgeable person you know, and it affected the way I was talking about it, because I assume Dr. Zerhouni is a great guy, did, uh, did this. But he talked about this new drug, Aduhelm, receiving conditional approval. But my understanding is they received not conditional approval, but actually accelerated approval. And the conditional approval is something that basically uh, is a European function. But over here, this received uh, real approval. And I think uh, in a, in a I say conditional approval because that's what Dr. Zerhouni said. But I want to tell our audience that Aduhelm has been approved, uh, uh, and it's a big deal. Deal, you know, words matter, and I want to make sure that everyone knows this, but your product has received FDA breakthrough device designation, and I'm just interested because the FDA is talked about, and I have a good conversation coming up on the FDA, but I think that the, the, the question I have is, is, is the FDA playing a, uh, is it leaning in on these, on, on these challenges? Do you feel as if they're an active, positive partner? Um, are you impressed with what's happened with Adulhelm and, and, and what we've seen come through? And what is your, your you know, prognosis for the field and the interaction with, with the FDA on other promising therapies? Yeah, well, I, I, would, I would caveat it to say that it is a large field. And so I'm yeah. not sure that uh, any one person gets to make a prognosis on it, yeah. as it were. But I think that, you know, I think that the Adulhelm, the Adulhelm story is, is, is not over yet. There's been a number of kind of twists and turns along the path. Um, when they were able to receive their approval. And then they've certainly had some issues around, around safety and acceptance in the marketplace. But I think that, I think that this is actually an example of, of when the FDA is trying to help promote innovation in a space, right? I think it's been mentioned a number of times today that prior to Agilehelm, it was, it's been 18 years since the last approval, right? I was working in the pharmacological side of working with a company developing novel Alzheimer's drug at that time. Um, my children were just born. They're now going off to college, right? That's how long it's been since we've seen an approval in this space. And so I think the FDA's, the FDA's um, ability to embrace an innovative challenge, we saw two things there, right? We saw a approval for novel, a novel therapeutic in this space, first one in, in 18 years. And we saw the first approval for a therapeutic intervention um, that has that is targeted towards disease modification, not just treating symptoms, but trying to to change the the undermining the under the underlying etiology of this disease progression. And that's mm. very exciting. 
because companies like Cognito, we, we focus on using um, neuromodulation and, and changing the, the electrical activity across the brain, but we're targeting the same thing. We're trying to change the underlying disease progression and not just try to address some of the symptoms. And so I think if you look at the FDA signaling that they're open to innovation in this space, and for the first time signaling and giving a nod towards a, a therapy that's going after a disease modifying um, mechanism of action in this space, I think, I think it makes it one of the most exciting times to be in the Alzheimer's space. And I think, I think the FDA needs to balance safety versus efficacy, but they also need to balance the, the unmet need and the demand from the patient advocacy side for seeing some movement in this space. And I think they've done a good job trying to balance that. Let me ask you finally, Brent, and perhaps an unfair question for someone who is as smart as you, a scientist and innovator in this area. The question I have is when you kind of look back and you look at the data and the incidence of Alzheimer's, we see yet again the same pattern you see across America's health spectrum, which is um, it, it is hitting certain communities, particularly black and Hispanic communities, disproportionately. Um, and I don't know what the causal driver is there, but I do know that polling shows, particularly in the uh, black community, that there is a lack of trust in the healthcare system, uh, creating uh, products that will either work for them or that they will be excluded. And I'm just interested in whether as you kind of run in the circles here, are we not doing something on the trust front that we should be, are we not doing something on the diversity and inclusion front so that we get a more holistic inclusion as we talk about this? Um, so maybe that's an unfair question to you because it's a really social and cultural question, but I do think it matters because there are a lot of folks out there that somehow are being hit by this differently um, than, than, say, my family members. Yeah, so I think that um, two thoughts to address that. Number one, from the more narrow Alzheimer's um, lens, right? When Dr. Creer was speaking a few minutes ago, she talked about um, you know, funding of over 60 different clinical studies um, out there right now. It is very actually, it's actually quite competitive to enroll patients in a phase three Alzheimer's study. We are launching two phase three studies, one in Alzheimer's and one in MCI later this year. And it's competitive. So when you have a competitive, when you have a competitive um, situation for enrolling, it actually, I think, helps with diversity and inclusion because you're trying to throw the net as widely as possible and bring in as many patients. And so I think that ultimately helps patients. It helps drive towards greater inclusion and diversity. Um, you know, I think that this is a little a field from some of the other things we've talked about. And I guess the other part of my answer is also a little bit a field. But I think if you look at what's happened over the last few decades, and this not specific to Alzheimer's whatsoever, but we've seen a, a increasing disintermediation of the patient primary care physician relationship. And you know, I think that you see the ripple effect of this through through anti-vaccine, through so many different um, so many different threads that have come through the healthcare the healthcare discussion and healthcare debate. And I think as we have increasingly disintermediated and and weakened that bond between between primary care physician and patient, where many patients don't have a primary care physician that they know by name, I think that that undermines trust. And I think in the world of healthcare, whether you're a provider, um, whether you are developing novel therapeutics like we, we do at Cognito, or even if you're in the payer side, you know, trust is, is the foundation of any brand that you can build in healthcare. And I think we're seeing some of the ripple effect from that. Are you in this for the long run? This is, this is what I do. This is what I've been doing uh, ever since I got out of school. Um, and you know, healthcare is not for everyone, but um, you know, what I tell people in the company, not everybody has to be passionate about moving the needles in Alzheimer's, just the people that work here. Really, really great story. Thank you so much for sharing it. Thanks again to Brent Vaughn, CEO of Cognito Therapeutics. I hope you'll come back. I love seeing folks do what you're doing out there, and I hope you'll come back and talk to us again. Thank you so much for having me. Receiving an Alzheimer's or dementia diagnosis impacts patients, of course, but it also affects their loved ones and affects their caregivers. It affects their communities. 
Joining me now is Aisha Adkins, constituency organizer for a nonprofit, Caring Across Generations. Aisha became a caregiver, caregiver after her mom was diagnosed with, I'm going to, frontotemporal dementia before the age of 60. Aisha, thank you so much uh, for joining us. And I really feel strongly that we get stories of lived experience into you know, our discussions of bureaucracy, the FDA, funding levels, that we remember real people are involved. Um, I'd love to hear, as you think about caring across generations, and I've always thought interge there's, an, there's a strength in intergenerational, intergenerationality, if you will. Uh, not a lot of people get it, you do get it. But, but tell us what you're approaching, tell us what inspired you, your mom's story, um, and how's it going? Well, certainly. Thank you so much for having me, Steve, and for including uh, the caregiver experience. So my mother was diagnosed with frontotemporal dementia in 2013. She was only 57 years of age. And the diagnostic process was a challenging one. It took around two years to get a proper diagnosis. And that was following uh, several misdiagnoses, uh, initially starting with simply uh, menopause-related stress. And so certainly my initial exposure to uh, the, the diagnostic system, uh, as you alluded to in, in the last uh, segment, uh, kind of issues around trust uh, within uh, communities of color and, and the healthcare system, making sure that we are believed when we present with symptoms was certainly something that inspired me to advocate on behalf of my mother and her her lived experience and also what my father and I observed as the symptoms that were very concerning, changes in behavior and mood that were very uncharacteristic of her. And this journey has certainly made me passionate about advocating not only for those living with dementia, but for uh, those of us who are providing care. I've been caring full time for my mother since she was diagnosed. And it's certainly been a challenging journey, making sure that I get access to the services that I need, like home and community-based services, long-term care, uh, and also making sure that my mother gets the equitable care that she deserves. Do you know, I remember, um... I guess it was, uh, I know this is an odd way to think about it, you know, two uh, presidential races ago, we were, we were doing uh, events and we had the Alzheimer's Association working with us. So we had a lot of, you know, political candidates and everything. And we brought someone who was actually living with Alzheimer's into the conversation, one of the most impactful conversations I've ever had. Because this was a person who was uh, uh, trying to find their way and trying to share what they were feeling and going through. and this. This, what I'll never forget is this gentleman shared how important it was to him to finally find someone who could help him navigate, help him navigate through this kind of what you just described. How do you do that? I mean, I, this is so unfair, but how do you do that in a way that's more systemized, available, easy to get, and predictable? Because that's what people are in the very front end of this, is lonely, frustrating, and and. Uh, filled with um, anxiety. And so I guess the question is, how do we make that a, um, an easier, less stressful, predictable process? Sorry to be long-winded on it, but I think it's so important what you do. Well, certainly. Well, I think a number, there are a number of ways that we can approach this. Certainly making sure that we fund the systems that are already in place where there are social workers and uh, the, you know, the providers and uh, other uh, you know, really relevant parties who are assisting and you know who are there to assist you through this process. But it's also removing some of that red tape that creates uh, barriers. But in addition to that, making sure that underserved communities have the access that they need, making sure that there is education around the disease and making sure that folks have access to uh, ongoing uh, primary care and uh, specialists care, uh, you know, oftentimes these diseases are, diseases are diagnosed by a neuropsychiatrist, but those can be very difficult to come by, also very expensive, particularly for the uninsured. So making sure that those needs are, are met uh, and uh, making sure that we kind of remove some of the, the, ambigu the ambiguous process of uh, applying for, for local services. And then also, of course, expanding, expanding Medicaid so that once a diagnosis is received, that there are 
things you can put in place to make the process a little bit easier. Certainly it won't be easy, but uh, perhaps with a bit of help, it can kind of cushion the blow. Aisha, you know, one of the things is, and I'm going to get a frame is, you know, you, you said that your mom got uh, diagnosed uh, around 57 years of old, that, that to, to many people by any standards, young. Uh, but you talk about millennial caregivers. And I'm just wondering, are there missing things that we're, we're not doing when it comes to building literacy among millennials? You know, so that so it's not just a reactive thing. Oh, my family member has this, so I have it. But building greater awareness among a, a next generation of people that this is a collective responsibility, um, a shared responsibility, a social responsibility and priority. I, I, I know that may, may not uh, be easy, but it just sort of seems to me to be potentially missing right now. Certainly, well, I agree. That is a certainly a missing component of a, a lot of discussions. I think, unfortunately, Within Western society, there's a tendency to uh, to silo based on generation, uh, whereas in in many cultures, you have uh, intergenerational households, uh, everyone living under the same roof, bearing witness to one another's experiences. Whereas, you know, in the United States in particular, what we see is there's this uh, standard or this criteria for success in adulthood, and that is leaving the home at 18 or 21. And so there becomes this disconnect. And in order to really create empathy, which is where I believe that change begins, it's, you need to be pre in each other's presence. And I think one silver lining with the, the pandemic is that many people did find themselves in those intergenerational households once again. Mm. And it allowed people to really see a changes in their, their parents or their grandparents or aunts and uncles, whatever that relationship happens to be, and to take note and to say, you know, gosh, I, I think there might be something wrong here. So it really gave the opportunity for earlier intervention, but making sure that wherever the living situations are, that those relationships um, are, are strengthened is, is certainly going to be key. But also another component of that is culture change and changing the way that we view aging, really rebranding aging, right? And, and reading our culture of the, the tropes and the stereotypes associated with uh, getting older. You know, I, I really recall growing up and my associations with aging came from really children's television. There was always the the older adult who was who was forgetful, and that forgetfulness was often the punchline. And that's very problematic because, once again, we are poking fun at a, a very serious, very fatal disease. You know, one of the things I'm reading here is this profile of you. In the, in the Washington Post that ran in December. It's really powerful about your mom and basically outlined, you know, that when she got her diagnosis, it came too late for her to, to outline her own care um, preferences. I mean, it just sort of brings to life, you know, the, the burden that you have. Um, and it also talks about black and Latina women, which we were just raising, you know, a minute ago um, with the previous speaker. What is your sense, I mean, uh, I, I, I guess what what would help? What would be the elements of helping? You know, I read this and I read, you know, COVID has hit, you know, the availability of, 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 of support. But I, I'd like to know for you, if we if we had you in, in, in Washington uh, with a bunch of senators and congressmen, members of the administration, and you had um, 10 minutes with them, what would you say, look, you have to fix this because this is what's happening in the real world? Most certainly. So very simply put, I would ask them to fund and to support Build Back Better and to make a full investment in home and community-based services. Caring for someone who is living with dementia is financially, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually exhausting and physically exhausting. And it's not necessarily because we don't want to provide care for our loved ones, but it is very challenging, particularly as the disease progresses and people begin to lose uh, lose their daily functions and can no longer uh, carry out their activities of daily living, uh, bathing themselves, dressing themselves, and making other major decisions for themselves. And so by 
making sure that we uh, fund the home care workers, making sure that they can make living wages so that when they come into our homes, they are well supported, that they have access to health insurance and making sure that they are well trained. And so that there is a mutually beneficial relationship there and making sure that things like adult day programs and other community resources are, are really robust. Those are the sorts of investments that are truly life-changing. Additionally, things like paid leave. I know that I was very concerned as I searched for a job. I graduated from college in 2009 and we were still really reeling from the effects of the Great Recession. And one of my biggest challenges in my job search once I became my mother's caregiver was whether or not to disclose my status as a caregiver, understanding that there were already barriers and biases that I had to face going into the job market as a Black woman. And now I have this label of caregiver, I have these care responsibilities, and there's already that pay inequity as a woman. So there are many, many different layers and components, and there are also a lot of solutions that we can address as, as a nation, as the only nation in the world that uh, does not have uh, paid leave. And so the only uh, mm. developed nation in the world that does not have paid leave. So it's there are definitely solutions that are available. It's a matter of making sure that our elected officials come together because it's, this is not a partisan issue. Dementia does not care what side of the aisle you reside on. Right it can and will affect your family. So making sure that we have consensus on that and right. and that we move swiftly and that we move uh, with enthusiasm toward right. providing these solutions um, and also making sure that we rid uh, rid the health, the dis social determinants, determinants of health that have also been spoken about today, making sure that we do all that we can to address the system oppression and uh, making sure that we don't prolong uh, racial and uh, social, the, the trauma of racial uh, and social violence against women, violence against um, black and brown bodies. Mm -hmm. These are all things that are somewhat seemingly unrelated, but that right. really have an impact on uh, the care experience uh, from a black and brown perspective. Right. Well, Aisha Atkins, you're welcome back anytime. This is an incredibly uh, uh, great, I'm very, very grateful for you to come in and share um, your mother's uh, experience, your experience, and your work uh, with caring across uh, generations. Really appreciate your, your thoughts and candor today. Certainly, Steve. Thank you so much for having me. Joining me now is Congressman Mark Wayne Mullen from Oklahoma, uh, Truth in Advertising. I'm from Oklahoma, too, Bartlesville. Uh, who, he co-chairs oh, wow. the Congressional Social Determinants of Health Caucus. I just want to tell you, you got another Okie on here. Uh, and it's well, great to be my, with you, my sir. My roommate in college was from Bartlesville. His name is uh, Wes Barnhart, and well, just, uh, I, it's just a great, great guy. Well, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an awesome part of the world. But I just want to say, great to have you on with us. Look, you are. Um, I don't know if you are unique in Congress because everyone has um, their connection to this. Uh, some are more aware of it than others. You are very aware of Alzheimer's because of your own family, and you're very overt and, and very open about sharing that with your constituents, with your colleagues. Could you share it with our viewers now? Yeah, you know, um, it's been part of my family for, unfortunately, generations. My uh, uh, great-grandfather um, died of dementia. Uh, my uh, my grandmother at the time was take, take, uh, took care of him. My dad remembers the whole story. Then the irony of that is that my grandmother, who was taking care of him, uh, she passed away of Alzheimer's. And it was a long battle. It was six years uh, of it. Uh, and, uh, you know, my dad, uh, his sisters, his brothers, they would rotate every other week to go down and take care of her. Because we live in, we have a unique challenge that we live in a very rural. So, I tell everybody when you get to know where, go another mile, and you get to our house. And uh, my my granny, well, I say my grandmother, but she was granny. Uh, she lived even farther out than we did, and so it's, it, you just don't have healthcare workers that's able to go by uh, or 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 um, in home uh, professionals that could even stick, could even go set with her. So they would rotate every other week for six years. They did this. Um, now, unfortunately, uh, we're dealing with it again. Uh, my, my dad already has, um, uh, two brothers 
with um, its current living that, that has dementia. And uh, unfortunately, we just lost uh, a brother, uh, Uncle Daryl, who uh, struggled with dementia for um, also uh, almost seven years. And we just, we, we literally uh, spoke at his funeral uh, three, three months ago. And his last year was rough. It was, my Uncle Daryl was probably one of the sweetest guys you ever met. Same thing with my granny. My granny handled it with grace. She was just such a graceful woman to begin with. And uh, my Uncle Daryl was too. Uncle Daryl, he was uh, just one of the nicest guys you ever met. Uh, a heart full of the Lord. Uh, was just uh, the most caring person. He had a, a prison ministry that he went to um, every single Sunday. Uh, he went and visited county jails. Uh, he This guy was I've never heard him say a bad word. Um, even when I would work with him and haul hay with him, uh, and I would, you know, stack the hay wrong in the barn, he wouldn't really yell at me. He'd just make me do it again. Uh, just one of those really nice guys, and uh, it, it was horrible. Hmm. I mean, it was really, really bad. His last, um, his last eight, mo- eight months were. It was, uh, it was difficult. I, I, I don't even want to describe yeah. it for the audience, just because it was. You know, I don't. If you're going through this, I don't want you to think that this is going to happen to your family because we went through it multiple times in our family I had, on both sides of my, but this is just my dad's side. My, my grandmother on my mom's side also passed away of dementia. And that was, that was real rough too. Uh, but this was the worst case I've ever seen. And wow. unfortunately we have a lot in the family, just telling you the ones of recent. And it was the, it was one of the worst cases that I've ever seen. It was really horrific. And, and, and my dad's struggling with it right now. My dad's 75. Uh, and fortunately, he has a sharp mind. But he is, after seeing my Uncle Daryl go through it, he is, he's, he's scared. And my dad, I don't know whatever makes him scared, but it was very difficult on him to see this. And he is just so afraid that he's going to end up the same way. And um, uh, of course, my other uncles, uh, they saw it too, but they're in and out of, of reality right now already. And, um, and it's been tough. I mean, it's so you, really tough. So, it's tough for me too, because I, I don't, I got it on both sides of my family Yeah. and it's like, how do you make preparations for this? What do you do? Right. You know, there's tests to be ran. I get that. And there's some prevention, fortunately with new medicine that's out there. So I think we're making an investment, but as your last, um, uh, it, uh, uh, guest was saying that we got to do more, we got to invest more Now we may disagree on the approach on how we need to invest in that. Right. But I do agree with her that we've got to do more. We we've, we've got to really take this on and see and be more proactive. Cause right now we, we seem to treat Alzheimer's as a reactiveness and it's a disease that I think if we spend that research on uh, that, we could get to the point where we're a lot more re, uh, proactive in this matter. All right. Well, you've been um, super uh, supportive and uh, co-chair of the Innovation Caucus. Right. You know, I've interviewed Fred Rupp, Upton and Diana uh, Deget about the Cures Act, and yeah. you know, trying to, to do this. And, and uh, honestly, I don't, I don't know. Um, how do I put this? I don't know who the political villain in this story is. Like, who's getting in the way of progress? Who is anti-innovation? And particularly when it comes to Alzheimer's and like stories like yours, which are so compelling. But I, I want to ask you, are, are, are there things that we should be doing in the innovation front that we're not? What's getting in the way? What are the speed bumps or roadblocks uh, from your point of view? Well, really, the, the access and the ability to try. You know, we passed a bill called Right to Try for young kids to just have access to adult cancer drugs. Um, and, uh, and that was because there was, at the time, there was only six or seven pediatric cancer drugs that were out there, right? Uh, but there was... There was uh, um, uh, literally over a hundred cancer drugs for adults, and we had we had to literally pass legislation and say you had the right to try. If there's a drug there that treats this cancer for an adult, then let the parents decide if they want to get, let their their child uh, have access to the drug too. Right now, what we have is is we have that same roadblock. We should have the right to try if if there if someone wants to be part of a clinical study that is that's going through this process of trying to find innovation of whatever the disease is and they and, and they want to they want to be at the forefront of it they, they want to volunteer for it there shouldn't be roadblocks there shouldn't be hurdles there if if someone's wanting to enter the space um it shouldn't be so costly just to get started i mean the amount of red tape just to get started a, a normal person 
that would think that they might have an idea how to do this couldn't even get started down some of these roads when it starts dealing with innovation on these complicated cases. Universities sometimes they have to stop some of the research because they run out of funding uh, because it's so expensive just to go through the regulations, the red tape, the bureaucracy of creating it. We need to get out of our own way. You know, we had the best and brightest minds out there. Uh, if we were to able to just get out of the way, and I mean that is the federal government, just kind of get out of the way, still not not do away with the safe and, and the safety and the and the and the um, health aspect of it, but just allow people to go, you know, get mm. started, go down that road, and and give them the assistance they need. I think this yeah. is something that can be solved. When you start talking about innovation, though, people are people are afraid of things that they don't understand. We as 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 individuals, we all have that. Like I I, I hate riding the subway and the metro here in DC. I, I hate it. I don't understand it, and I feel almost claustrophobic being in a tunnel and a tube going down underground that I have no control over. But other people do it every day, and they don't seem to mind. But at the same time, I have no problem driving a semi with a trailer behind it with a load of cattle, and I have no issues with it. And other people say that's crazy, but we fear things that I we don't. When I've been Oklahoma. driving a semi since I was 14. Yeah, I want to ride and, and with so, you out there. Uh, yeah, so the innovation of it, yeah. people have a tendency to just walk away from it because they don't want to take the time to understand it. I mean, they don't want to take the time to understand the technology and the benefits of it until it touches them. When it touches you, now all of a sudden you're willing to try anything. And, and, and it becomes real to you when it becomes your life uh, and, right. and not enough fortunately not enough people's had to deal with it but when they do they'll do anything they can they're desperate yeah. and innovation yeah. is something that we need to be encouraging we need to be supporting and we need to have the entry level into it not so burdensome but uh but a door that's open that's inviting and say if you can prove yourself then we're going to give you help to 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 continue to move yeah. forward as you as you develop Look, um, Representative uh, Mullen, we've got um, Senator Blunt um, hanging out, waiting to get online. He's got a heart out. So just, just I want to ask you real quick. No, I get it. You know, no, no. Yeah. I want to hit, I want to ask my friend from Oklahoma this, but you know, I, I am one who thinks there is a power in occasionally bringing the power and spotlight and the convening power of the White House to topics. And Alzheimer's seems to be one of those, like that the president last night in the State of the Union address mentioned Alzheimer's with regards to an ARPA-H initiative to try to focus. I'm sitting here saying maybe it's time, given being on the precipice, you know, uh, Agilhelm being approved, bringing this on, to do this. So if Joe Biden called, you know, Mark Wayne Mullen and said, hey, would you join me? Would you help us assemble, you know, a bipartisan group? Well, today's conference is sort of like my play on what a White House conference ought to look like, people from different corners of this conversation. Um, would you support something like that? Let's make some trouble. If, if, if he can promise we'll leave the politics out of it and put the country first, absolutely. I, I mean, I work, I, listen, I've been in business my entire life and I've never hired anybody based on being a Republican or Democrat, I always wanted the best person for the position. And we've been successful doing that. And I believe in working with that, but we have to be able to leave politics out of it. So often we allow politics to get in the way. And that means because we wanna get credit for it, or we wanna do just one more thing and this isn't about getting credit for it. this is about people's lives and so if we can put the people first leave republicans leave democrats out of it absolutely i'll work with anybody well representative mark wayne mullen of oklahoma i want to uh be hitchhiking out in uh, oklahoma one day when you're in your semi with some cattle hitched up and hope you'll pick <laughs> me up uh, thank you so much for telling your story for sharing how important this is really appreciate your candor and i hope you'll be back absolutely thank you sir thanks for having me on I'm very pleased now to welcome my next guest and a very good friend of the Hill, Senator Roy Blunt from Missouri. We were talking about him earlier in today's program. He's the ranking member on the Appropriations Subcommittee that oversees budgeting for the Department of Health and Human Services during his time in Congress. Senator Blunt has championed Alzheimer's research and innovation in big ways, as we were just discussing. Senator Roy, it's great to see you as always. Um, we were talking to Maria Carrillo uh, earlier, the chief uh, science officer of the mm -hmm. Alzheimer's Association who said you're the one who delivered basically the level of funding that has changed the game in Alzheimer's. Over $3 billion a year now, raising it during your tenure from 600 million. That's a quintupling of resources in this space. Um, tell, tell us um, what, what next uh, on your agenda on the Alzheimer's front. Well, Steve, great to be with you and, and great to follow Mark Wayne. He and I did something just a few months ago uh, on mental health, another thing uh, the president mentioned last night and another thing 
that uh, I've spent a lot of time on, and so is Mark Wayne Mullins. And so glad to be here with you, glad to be following him in, in this discussion. You know, when I did become the chair of that committee half a dozen years ago, NIH research uh, hadn't had any real increase uh, in, a, actually no increase in about a dozen years. And uh, we've been able to increase the budget of NIH research by 43%, uh, but the huge increase of the individual categories, the biggest increase of all was in Alzheimer's. It's the disease that uh, more and more people dread having. You know, for years there's been a, a, a poll question of what disease do you fear the most? And that's always been cancer since the question yeah. was being asked. But uh, Alzheimer's is right up there with cancer. Uh, the two previous guests both had uh, personal experiences with this. And this is one of those diseases that have in, impact families in ways that are just unanticipated and overwhelming. Uh, and so uh, more and more people see the impact of this disease, know the importance of finding a way forward. And uh, I hope we can do that. And I hope it does become the kind of priority that you just talked about uh, as one of the things that Arch ARPA H, uh, as I believe the president envisions it, would be able to focus on an immediate challenge with a thought that we've finally got a place here that we can move forward. Let's put all our effort behind that, unlike the normal NIH grant, more like the defense uh, research grants that we've done as partnerships, frankly, in some ways, more like uh, warp speed uh, in vaccines or the testing things we did with what Senator Lamar, Lamar Alexander and I called the shark tank, where once you got through the shark tank with your idea, the shark tank team actually became part of your team on an ongoing basis in a way that really produced uh, incredible results in a short period of time. So uh, our, uh, there's, there's no question that uh, Alzheimer's is becoming more and more the part of more and more lives as people live longer. And we've got to find uh, some way to, to uh, make a difference in Alzheimer's that we haven't quite found yet. Senator, I'm going to ask you a question, and I don't know how if I'm, if I'm going to get it out right, but I had this really fascinating conversation yesterday with a guy about sanctions. And he said, Steve, sanctions, you know, don't always work. But he says, you know, this, this guy who in Democratic and Republican administrations, you know, brought down John Gotti, brought down uh, global crime cartels, uh, uh, it, it, you know, brought down and influenced um, various bad governments in the world. And he says, you know, it's a war. Sanctions is a kind of war. And sometimes you're able to do things with a specificity of attack that makes a difference. And other times talking bland sanctions gets you nowhere. You know, you just scuff them up. But it just made me think this is a similar discussion. And you have insights rather than throwing a big blob of money at something. You just talked about Shark Tank. You just talked about a DARPA-like uh, approach. What are some of those things? And in the war with Alzheimer's, and I think it is a war uh, to some degree, you, increases the efficaciousness from your perspective of how we can look at results down the road uh, in improving the advancement of science, partnerships with corporations. You've been at this a long time. I'd just love to get your insights on what would be the right structural enhancements that we should make from a policy perspective. Well, I think we've made significant progress. Some of it is eliminating what we now believe won't work. Uh, with the traditional NIH, here's a grant, you're going to periodically report, you've got a, a more often a five-year structure to deal with, uh, and, and that's very traditional, but looking for specific ways that seem to have promise in terms of, of, of how do you slow this down? You know, in many cases, this is an aging disease. If you can slow it down enough, uh, it doesn't become a problem because other things overcome uh, your system, and, and this never quite gets there. Uh, Dr. Randy Bateman at Washington University, where they've had the Diane studies and other things on Alzheimer's for a long time, Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri, he and a group of his fellow uh, colleagues there uh, have come up with a blood test that they believe is going to have impact in narrowing down who should take the more defined test. I think that blood test is somewhere in the neighborhood of of 90% uh, of the time they can determine whether you're someone who should have the, uh, the, the more expensive, more intricate scan. Uh, and if you find out early enough 
that you've got this problem developing, I think there may be some things that we've already decided don't reverse uh, the impact of Alzheimer's or dementia, but in looking at this in another way might dramatically slow down that impact. And so whether it's a blood test or an eye scan is another thing that other researchers have looked at. If you could figure out ways to, in, in a, a mass testing kind of way that was not expensive, not intrusive, not, not too difficult, could determine that in all likelihood, no, you're not gonna, you're not gonna have this problem. So we don't need to um, have the brain scan, which is now one of the few ways you can look at and see if the amyloid buildup is there or the other things that the cognitive problems with Alzheimer's. And you mentioned the war. Let me say one other thing about that. You know, the current cost, Steve, of Alzheimer's economically is about one half of the defense budget. Wow. You, you wow. Know, these numbers get big and you don't know what to, how do you put them in context, but one half of every, every plane, every ship, every military base, every every military payroll, every uniform, every trade do trading dollar all over the world for the United States. One half of that now is being spent on Alzheimer's with either direct government help or, or the uh, other costs that aren't usually covered by insurance or anything else. And the projection is that by 2060 or so, uh, we could have a, a disease that the total cost of that disease is equal the defense budget of the United States of Missouri, and so when you and the United States of America, and so when you think about the the broad expansion of that, you're suddenly beginning to see the economic cost. And then you just had two guests on that talked about the dramatic emotional um, cost to families involved. This is this is a disease where it's all. It seemed to me, looking at it for some time now that the, the caregivers, the people that care about somebody with Alzheimer's in many ways are more impacted by the disease than the person who has Alzheimer's. Given the scale and the impact on, on, on families' lives, America, you just talked about the costs and burden. Do, do, you, do you think it's not time for a White House, this White House, President Biden's White House, to consider doing what we're trying to do today, diff, bring different corners of the debate together and have a White House conference focused on beating Alzheimer's? Well, whether it's a White House conference or not, I don't know the right kind of focus, but I do know in the discussions I've been with the, the White House on the whole concept of ARPA-H, uh, you know, the president and many others for his own family and, and personal history always begins to look at cancer as one of the topics, but I think they're also looking and understanding that what we just talked about, that Alzheimer's has to be one of the things that we uh, do our best to, to make a difference on. We've made a huge difference already on cancer with immunotherapy and other things that weren't part of the treatment regimen for cancer. Just. Uh, just a handful of years ago that are now one of the go-to treatments for many of the cancers people have where your own system figures out with a little, with some help, some restructuring, how to fight back. Uh, so we're making progress there. There's more progress we need to make. Uh, but, uh, you know, there are other things that also ought to be in the line of consideration. And if you're looking at a, at a defense uh, research agency kind of view, I think you really need to be looking for that moment that we need to move outside the normal confines of, of ex expedited research huh. and, and go to a further uh, commitment to find this, if this, th this one thing works or not, and if it does, how do we quickly deploy it uh, to try to get, on the, uh, to get on the other side of this uphill battle we've been fighting uh, with Alzheimer's for a long time now, but the older the population gets, the more people are going to be affected by these aging diseases. And uh, we don't want we, we don't want to suggest getting older is a bad thing. What we do want to suggest is let's uh, let's see what we can do to identify and slow down, if not eliminate, eliminate if possible, but slow down uh, this uh, tendency that people have as they age. Uh, to, to have these uh, dementia types, types of issues become part of their daily life and maybe more importantly, in many ways, the daily life of everybody who cares yeah. about them. 
Really quick, Roy, somebody just sent me your resume. I guess word is out. You're looking for a new job. I'm uh, <laughs> going to get this. And, you know, we're, we're happy to consider doing an interview. But I guess my big question is, you know, beside the interview we'll do set up later, um, are your colleagues going to be the heroes you've been as they succeed you once you leave the sen Senate, maintain the priority that you have on Alzheimer's? Well, I hope so. And, you know, we're looking uh, one of the things I'm doing in this last year in the Senate is looking for people to to step up in areas like NIH research and Alzheimer's specifically and Special Olympics and other things, uh, Pell Grants, other things that I feel like I've been one of the principal advocates for to be sure that we continue to have uh, that person there that's filling that advocacy role and getting others to join them. And I'm, I'm confident that will happen, but uh, it won't happen all by itself. Well, I love my conversations with you, and I'm going to continue them with you, whether you're in the Senate or not. But Senator Great. Roy Blunt from Missouri, thank you so much for joining us, as always. It's, it's good to know I'll have somebody to talk to when I'm done working. <laughs> so thank you a lot. Thank you. Innovations in Alzheimer's therapies may show promise, but regulation, safety, access, and affordability are all really important factors in getting treatments into the hands of patients. Joining me now to discuss policy implications and the impact on patients are Rachel Scher, partner at Manat Health and former senior policy analyst at the FDA, and Nora Super, executive director of the Center for the Future of Aging at the Milken Institute. Thanks so much for joining me today. Let me just start out with Rachel, um, and really to both of you and ask about the kind of regulatory infrastructure, the payment infrastructure, essentially the bureaucracy around care. And, and I know that bureaucracy is part about managing and you know, managing public policy equities and trying to get things right, um, but it's also frustrating to a lot of the folks that are in it. Um, Rachel, you know the FDA and the FDA's role, but can you share with us where the FDA uh, and our concerns today about looking at Alzheimer's and, and the growth of its impact on our population is for you. Yeah, I, I'm here, I think, to talk a little bit about sort of FDA's role in this whole system and most relevant, what does FDA approval mean and how do drugs get approved? FDA is the main consumer watchdog that allows Americans to have access to the safest and most advanced pharmaceutical system in the world. Before a, a company can sell a drug, it needs to conduct studies to show that it is safe and effective for its intended use. The company then submits this evidence to FDA, who then conducts an independent and unbiased review to determine whether the drug's health benefits outweigh its known risks. And if it does, if the risks are outweighed by the benefits, then FDA can approve the drug to be marketed. But given the recent controversies and concerns that have been raised around the, the uh, Alzheimer's treatments, et cetera, I think it's an important time to take a step back and remember why do we even have an FDA? How did we get here? And if you'll bear with me for one moment, I want to just quickly walk through some of the history because I think it's really important to remember where we are now and how we got here. So FDA was actually established in 1906 around the passage of the Pure Food and Drugs Act. And that law, while it was groundbreaking at the time, only prohibited interstate and foreign commerce in adulterated food and drugs. So for the first time, drugs had to be pure and of a certain quality to be marketed, but it quickly became clear that that wasn't enough to protect consumers. There were many instances of fraudulently marketed products that claimed to cure all kinds of ailments and diseases and led to injuries and deaths. And then in 1937, there was a particularly tragic disaster associated with a drug given to children it was actually made from an extremely toxic chemical closely related to antifreeze. And over 100 people died, including a lot of children. There were a lot of other examples of harm too. And FDA at the time actually compiled all these examples into what one reporter referred to as the American Chamber of Horrors. So it became clear that more needed to be done. And in 1938, Congress passed another law to require for the first time that drugs get pre-market approval from FDA before the drugs are marketed. 
But the only thing that was looked at then was whether the drug was safe. Once again, following the passage of that law, it became clear on the basis of a lot of tragedies and harm to consumers that more needed to be done again. And in 1962, there was another set of laws that were passed for the first time to require that drugs be shown to be effective too, so that they actually do what they say they will do. So now we have a standard that FDA has to look at to see whether the drug is safe and effective for the intended use. And FDA really plays an absolutely critical role in protecting us all from unsafe drugs and ensuring that we have access to effective ones. Do you think, um, Rachel, just before I jump over to Nora, that when it comes to um, the point we are at right now, we've had you know, an FDA uh, provisionally approved drug in this drug called Aduhelm, and, and I, I, I know that you're not necessarily focused on Alzheimer's, but I think part of this story is there hasn't been a drug approval in this area for 19 years. So it's been sort of bleak. And so I think one of the questions we're gonna be dealing with today among a lot of uh, uh, experts is, are we at that moment where we were in, with cancer 20 years before cancer began to get real you know, efficaciousness, where we're at that, that innovation point where science and need and capacity is coming together? What, what does your gut tell you? I mean, I think it's really important to make sure that we have a regulatory system that strikes the right balance between speedy approvals and careful approvals. The, the balance between safe and effective drugs has really got to be there. But I think it's important also to remember that the progress of science takes time. We are constantly learn, learning more and more, but that just doesn't happen overnight. And again, as I was just mentioning, we really need the FDA to act as an independent auditor of the data and science underlying the drugs and medical devices that come out for approval. And I think the history shows how important that role is. Right. Um, Nora, as, as Rachel just said, science and public safety take time, but that talk is ticking for a lot of people. Um, dementia is a reality. It's, it's part of our lives and families and communities. Um, and you have been a very forceful critic of some of the neglect that's been baked in as we care uh, for those um, who, who need our support and, and who are in dementia. Would you share with us your thoughts of where we need to improve our act? Sure, happy to do so. And thank you for having me here today. Um, in, in 2021, we launched the Milken Institute Alliance to improve dementia care for exactly the reason that you stated. Um, not only are there a lack of treatments that we've known for years, but there's a lack of coordinated system based on how our federal programs pay for service and delivery in our country. And so millions of people living with dementia and their families and caregivers have struggled with uh, the opportunity to try new treatments as well as getting care delivered in a comprehensive coordinated way. Um, as, you, as Rachel mentioned, you know, we do need to rely on science and we need to go through the process. The FDA pay, pays a very, plays a very critical role. Uh, at the same time, with, with diseases like Alzheimer's disease and other related dementias, the prevalence has been growing uh, dramatically. And as our population mm. ages, we will continue to see more and more people diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease and related dementias over the next several decades, in fact, even doubling. And so those people who are living with are just desperate for some sort of solution, some sort of cure. We've been working on a cure for a very long time, but I did wanna note your analogy to cancer. I think what we're seeing in the treatment area is a better understanding of brain disease and how it may be treated, and, and most experts are seeing that it will be treated more like cancer in the future with multiple types of treatments uh, available and an opportunity for more precision medicine. We have, um, you know, there's unlikely to be one cure that patients take, but that's why it's important for us to have a, a multitude of therapies available for people. At the same time, you know, I also was a federal employee um, at the White House Conference on Aging under President Obama, and the payment system is critical as well. 
if we come up with the best treatments in the world and no one can afford them, then that uh, is not helpful as well. So CMS has an important role to play as they look at, um, you know, what what opportunities are available for their patients. Now, this decision, um, the FDA decision and the CMS decision, are really um, controversial. A lot of people have been talking about the way the decisions have been made. And I don't want to weigh in on that. In our alliance, we have nearly 100 member organizations uh, that have different points of view on this topic. But what they all agree upon is that we need to focus more on early detection and diagnosis Mm -hmm. and therapies that can work because the people who are living with today, they can't wait three or five years for people to come up with the, the right therapy. They're right. living with this disease right now. And anything we can do to make sure that they're getting coordinated, comprehensive care, right. the earlier people get diagnosed, the better, because most of these therapies that are in the system, including Adohelm, are really targeted to people with mild cognitive impairment. And so a big focus we should have is making sure people get diagnosed early so they can take advantage of therapies that are in the pipeline and available today. But before I jump back to, to Rachel, uh, Nora, let me ask you, I've been reading uh, some of your statements out there, and one, uh, very powerful, one of them uh, that caught my eye um, was your critique, critique that our traditional Medicare program is designed to reward volume over value. And with all the health care reform, I mean, broadly outside of Alzheimer's, but you know, what I thought Obamacare was supposed to be about was to move, move from fee-for-service to wellness, to try to look at the whole person, begin looking at everything from mental health and kind of you know, create a more holistic approach to health and that ecosystem and what it means. But your critique is very specific and, and, and says this is not the case uh, when it comes to treating those patients suffering from dementia. And I'll tell our audience, what I also learned in my research in this is, this is America's most expensive disease. The costs of this are the biggest financial burden uh, across uh, classes of disease, as I understand it. So so what, what are we getting wrong on that front, if you can give us a snapshot real quick of that? Absolutely. Um, yes, I am not a fan of the fee-for-service uh, system that we've had historically <laughs> under the Medicare program, and it encourages people to order tests and procedures that may not be necessary to prescribe uh, medications that could be contraindicated with other medications. And so I really am uh, a big advocate of of coordinated care. Now, we have moved Mm. in that direction more since the Affordable Care Act was uh, enacted, and even Mm. before that with nearly 40% of Medicare beneficiaries now in Medicare Advantage plans. And the administration, since the Obama administration, has been moving towards value-based care and, in fact, made quite a statement earlier this year saying they want to have all of the systems paid by value-based care systems. So accountable care, um, many of the test pilots that have been out there, and we advocate at the alliance that we really should have an alternative payment method for people living with dementia and their caregivers. As you mentioned, right. it's extremely expensive. It's also the sixth leading cause of death. And right. right now, the care that people receive is uncoordinated, fragmented, extremely costly, and not really in, it does not right. look at what the patients and their families really want. Right, thank you. Uh, and just real quickly, Rachel, I, 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 I'd love to ask you, the other day I talked to Dr. Janet Woodcock, who is, I, I guess, has been the acting administrator of the FDA, now the, dep- I think, the uh, uh, principal deputy administrator now. Um, and she, we, this is a conversation we were having about rare diseases, and she seemed really open to finding ways to build in patient voice, to build in rare disease advisors and into various parts of the uh, FDA regulatory and oversight process. And her openness and the willingness to jump in was very impressive to me, actually. And I'm just wondering, given you know your insights into the FDA, and, and, I, and I say m- most of us don't understand. It's an opaque place that has a lot of you know power, but not a lot of people understand the mechanics. But just, just real, I, I know it's unfair, but in short form, what are the elements of FDA structural reform in this area or structural enhancement that might bring uh, lived experience, that might bring in uh, some of the issues and kind of knowledge reservoirs into a process, or do you think it is just fine as it is? 
you know, FDA has really shown some fantastic leadership in finding ways to really incorporate the patient voice into all phases of the drug development process, particularly in obviously the FDA review process. I think they've really come a long way in recognizing that the old way of doing things is not enough, that we've got to look at the the symptoms and really hear out the patient's experience, lived experiences with these diseases and help that get built into the drug mm -hmm. development process. This has also been something that Congress has been very interested in over the years. The user fee reauthorization is coming up and there's likely to be more uh, discussions around ways mm. to continue this trend, but I think FDA has really done a fantastic job to date of putting the patient front and center in, in everything it does. Well, I really appreciate this conversation because it's not often when we have a focus, particularly in diseases, that we get to talk about the structural dimensions of the regulatory authorities, the payment authorities. You know, I once talked to somebody in healthcare, and they said, I asked him, "What's the biggest deal?" You know, it, uh, that you could reform. And he says, "Payments." And and you know, it just is, does not make the headlines uh, of of most papers or discussions. So I really want to thank uh, both of you, Rachel Share, partner at Manat Health, former senior policy analysis at the FDA, and she was former FDA. Council of the Energy uh, and Commerce Committee, and Nora Super, who's Executive Director of the Center for the Future of Aging at Milken Institute. And I assume you have a really great website with resources on that, uh, Nora, but I want to thank you so much for, for joining me for this discussion today. Thank you. Appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Folks, I also want to remind everyone that, because uh, we discussed Aduhelm uh, a number of times today, that drug has been approved uh, by the FDA in the new U.S. market. I said provisional because it got kind of stuck in my head, but it has been approved. Uh, Europe may be a slightly different deal where conditional approval uh, is there, but in the United States, this is an approved drug. It's a very big breakthrough uh, in the, in the, uh, as seen by many after nine years of not having uh, an approved drug, and Aduhelm is an approved drug, so I just want to make that clarification. Now, Alzheimer's and dementia don't impact all populations equally. Black and Hispanic Americans and women are more likely to develop forms of dementia. We've been discussing that several times today already. On top of that, people of color uh, often face barriers to healthcare access and healthcare trust as well. I'm now joined by a panel of experts, great experts, to, to discuss how patients can receive equitable Alzheimer's care. Petra Niles is a gerontologist and Senior Manager of African American Services at Alzheimer's Los Angeles. Catherine Schubert is President and CEO of the Society for Women's Health Research. And George Vradenberg, good friend, I mentioned him earlier today, uh, is Chair and Co-Founder of US uh, of Us Against Alzheimer's. Thank you so much for joining us. Petra, let me start with you. And we were discussing earlier um, the ongoing challenges of trust between different communities in the United States and the healthcare system, and this phenomena, which I detest, that when you look at COVID, when you look at so many chronic diseases, that uh, our communities of color in America carry a disproportionate burden in there. I really want this problem to go away. What do we do? And, and, and what's the Alzheimer's story? Thank you, Steve, for that question, for having me here. Uh, what do we do? Partly, um, education is critical here, providing culturally relevant education to a community that's highest uh, at highest risk for this. And what that looks like um, may have a variety of methods and that should be considered. We also need to consider making sure that terms and words used around this disease are defined in a way that the targeted audience understands it the same way as those that are presenting the information. One of the first um, uh, questions that I get in presenting information to our larger community is what is dementia? What is Alzheimer's? So simply understanding what the disease is and um, the risk factors or warning signs, that's critical to even knowing about the disease. Hmm. Can you share with us an example of how you use cultural competition, or comp, uh, 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 competence and language to, to bridge communities in Los Angeles? My, there, quite often I have to share information that includes the word caregivers, hmm. caregiving. 
And so my question to the, 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 the audience is, how do you see that word? I simply ask them, how do you see that word? Would you, and the response has been, I see caregiver as someone I hire to come in the home to assist the family to provide care. And so they do not recognize themselves as the caregiver. I am the husband, I'm the wife, I'm the daughter. And so if if um, a medical professional is asking who is the caregiver and the, uh, the patient does not identify as the caregiver, then the messages or the benefits regarding um, caregiving it's completely lost because of not identifying with the role. I, I, I appreciate that. We'll come back to that in a moment. Um, Catherine Schubert, thank you for joining us um, as well. Look, Francis Collins um, the other day made the comment that because of this era of COVID we've been in, we probably had a $10 billion setback in the advancement of, of science and uh, uh, therapies and research across the board, in part from everything from clinical trial sites closing, from uh, a huge drop off in clinical trial participation across lots of classes of disease. Um, I know that that's also been the case in Alzheimer's research. And, and so that creates another burden, even when I would say, as I know you know, that our clinical trial foundations were also not as representative as they should have been of our population. So I'd just love you to help us unpack it so we understand what we have to fix by getting representation in clinical trials, connecting the science, the drugs to people in the right way. But I wanna say the last two years has sort of sucked. <laughs> Thank you for that question. Um, I completely agree that this has been a challenge in a number of ways, and I think we're seeing it really play out now. Um, I think the one thing that maybe COVID has brought to light is this issue. So knowing that we don't necessarily have trial populations that reflect what the treatment population looks like. And you know, Petra talked a lot about what those communities look like. And we know that people of color are underrepresented in clinical trials. We know that women largely are still underrepresented in clinical trials um, when they're really disproportionately impacted uh, by Alzheimer's. And then when you add caregivers in there, that just exacerbates, um, I think, the challenges that we're seeing. Um, in terms of infrastructure, I think it's probably time for us to be thinking about new ways to get to people where they are, um, new ways to not just talk about um, how people are participating in trials or saying, oh, you should do this, but how do we make sure that people um, want to participate in those trials, right? So rather than just saying this is important and we need X population, we need their engagement. And you talked about this sort of centering, um, centering the patient and centering the person through these experiences. They really do need to be built into the trial design. So your data may look a little bit different. It may be captured in different ways, but there's lots of ways to do that so that you're, again, meeting people where they are, looking at what the treatment population looks like and trying to mirror it as best you can, but really learning from the community about how you can reach them. Now, Catherine, I've got you and, and Petra on. Do you two know each other already? No. <laughs> we do well, not. well, I want to introduce you to Petra. She's really cool. She's in LA. She's on the front line talking to community. So is she, is Petra the kind of person you would reach out to or try to build in so that as she's developing trust and connectivity with communities that are going through this journey, that they can be brought in? I mean, it did this recently in Minneapolis with some of Amy Klobuchar's folks in the Somali community. And, you know, we had various trusted ambassadors in that. But I'm just wondering, are there uh, playbooks to begin reaching out, you know, using cultural competence, using trusted ambassadors like Petra to to build them into trials. And is that high on the agenda um, for what you're trying to raise? Uh, uh, yeah, we absolutely have Catherine. to. I mean, there's no way we're going to change things unless we do that. And in fact, it's funny you mentioned that, Petra. I, I was mentioning your name the other day because as we're looking at these issues, again, 
we can't come into communities and tell them how things are. We, you know, the the experts in that area are the people who live in these communities and the trusted resources. So really um, leveraging that and making sure that that's the way that the message is being captured is extremely important. Oh, thank you. I hope we'll make sure we make sure you both are connected. But um, George Vradenberg, George, great to see you. Look, you, I think, Steve. and maybe this is a misframing. We've been friends for a long time. I just want to disclose that. I think when you and I first began discussing this topic, when I became aware of your um, uh, obsession and, and constructive commitment to moving the needle on Alzheimer's, it was the last time a drug was approved. It was about 20 years ago we've been having these discussions. Now, Aduhelm is out there, been approved. Um, you've been focused on this. How how uh, tectonic a shift is this? Um, what more do you expect around the, the, the corner uh, with what the FDA approval on Agile Helm means? Well, I'm going to back up just a little on the talk sure. about the representativeness issue. This sure. is a problem globally. 90% uh, of the genomics work in Alzheimer's has been done in white Caucasian populations. 90% hmm. uh, of the people are not white Caucasians. Uh, so that if you really want to get at this problem, I think you've heard earlier from uh, Elias Suhuni about the Davos Alzheimer's Collaborative, hmm. uh, which is a global effort uh, to bring in the intelligence of the world, uh, not just the intelligence in the United States and Europe, uh, to this problem. Uh, and also clinical trials that will be highly diversified once you get into the populations of the world. We recently opened a clinical trial site in Rio Grande Valley, Texas. Hmm. The population is 95% Latina. Hmm. Uh, boy, is the recruitment rate of minorities, in quotes, um, uh, high at that clinical trial site. So to Katie's point, we have to go where the people are that have Alzheimer's. 25% of that population in Rio Grande Valley has Alzheimer's. So that's way above uh, the national average. So this is a real problem that we need to get at structurally. ARPA-H, I think this is a, a program that uh, Biden has proposed, I think is a terrific idea of how to get new platforms, new transformational um, you know, technologies to lower the cost and increase the access of life-saving drugs uh, and other interventions. So I think ARPA-H is a terrific possibility to really attack this problem completely anew in totally different ways on how to get lower cost of treatments uh, and how to get the greater access well beyond the academic centers that are focused on this. Uh, finally, uh, you asked me about Adjuhelm. I'm sorry, I got some feedback there, but uh, you asked me about Adjuhelm. Um, uh, I, I think the FDA we have trusted the FDA for a long time to make the expert decisions on what drugs should be approved and what drugs should not be approved. They found this drug to be safe and effective, and as you noted, uh, they've approved it. Now, everyone can have their own facts, everyone can have their own scientific facts, but we've assigned this responsibility to a specific agency uh, by law, uh, and they've made the determination. So on my view, that drug should be out there, available according to the label on that drug, uh, and the confirmatory trial should be policed to make sure that it happens quickly uh, and that it confirms the clinical benefit of the drug. CMS's decision really is going to set us way back. You remember Obama's goal was to find a means of prevention and effective treatment by 2025. Uh, the CMS decision is basically going to make that impossible. They basically, they basically destroyed uh, our ability to get to, uh, to, uh, to a, a means of treatment by 2025. Now, why do I say that? They basically say, even after you've been approved by the FDA, conducted the clinical trials needed to get that approval to prove your drug is safe and effective. Now, Medicare is going to go through another round of clinical trials hmm. in order to themselves verify that it is safe and effective. Well, that process of doing another clinical trial is going to take up to 10 years. So basically, we have deferred now the ability of uh, people with early uh, uh, AD to get access to any drugs, or at least the first class of drugs, uh, for 10 years. That is unconscionable. Now, the population that is experiencing this disease is, as you mentioned, is skewed uh, uh, against minorities. So denying uh, the population access to these new drugs. And it's not just Adjuhelm, it's from Lo Lilly, from Roche, from ASI, four drugs uh, will be denied to the American population, 
which is skewed against minorities and women, it's going to be denied for at least 10 years. That's right. unconscionable. Unconscionable. Um, Petra, I would love to um, get your reaction to what George Fradenberg just shared, because you're dealing with a community where you're trying to, you know, improve access, improve trust, improve services. And there's been a, a decision that only those within trials, and of course, we know uh, the disproportionate um, representation of certain groups in trials and the uh, uh, lack of representation of other communities, all they hear George is trying to you know, work on that. But, but what's your view of, of the CMS decision? I appreciate George's comments and I do defer to him for those. I would like to share that uh, how do we get treatment to those who need it? We can begin with already established community health centers hmm. in communities where um, the majority of uh, those at risk reside and to be able to support those uh, in policies, um, funding in a way that they are able to educate the community, those who come in to the centers, that they're able to provide screening and to be able to, um, again, provide resources. We do know that there are there can be a reduction of risk factors. And so specific to those risk factors, um, looking at foods and lifestyle changes that can be had and made to uh, reduce your risk for uh, this disease. So it's very important to consider those. Um, I think reducing the risk is so much better than relying on the medication to come to solve an issue. Thank you, thank you Katie. For the question. Yeah, thank you, Katie. Um, just want to ask you, you know, as you, work, you think about broadly um, the world of women's health research, in, in other areas that may be seemingly unrelated, are there any patterns or structures or best practices or, or you know, I, I, I've, you know, traveled with Joe Biden before where, you know, he was, you know, launching the cancer moonshot and he, you know, got SAP and Google and other companies there that weren't necessarily in cancer research, but said, hey, we may, we may de-silo some of these. Are there, are there are just any insights that we should put on the table with our audience today from your experience in other disease fronts? Yes. Well, I mean, I think, first of all, when we think about women's health specifically, right, we have to think about, again, both the patient and the caregiver, knowing that two thirds of caregivers are women um, and particularly in the Alzheimer's space, that's extremely important. Um, and again, to Petra's point, they're mostly unpaid. And so mm. um, what does that mean? Uh, we're seeing, you know, loss of of economic dollars, a large burden, et cetera. Um, and I think that translates to many areas of mm. health generally, right? Women are um, known as the chief medical officers of their families. They're making healthcare decisions for uh, maybe aging parents. They're also making decisions for children. Um, and so I think there are a lot of challenges here. And I'm, I'm glad that you brought up uh, the moonshot. I sort of have this broad vision. I'll put it out here with everybody here to really see some dedicated prioritization and dollars toward women's health broadly and across the lifespan. So not necessarily disease specific, although that's really important and we have to continue that work. On top of that, how do these different life stages interact with one another so that your healthcare impact can be better um, throughout your life? And so I think for me, that's something that's really important. Um, and something that I think would go a long way just in terms of valuing health, again, across the board throughout the lifespan and um, would make a big impact here as well. George, finally, I'm going to give the last word to you. And, you know, and I'm going to ask you a, a, a bifurcated question, two parts unrelated. Part one is I'm fascinated to hear about the trials that you've gone out to find where there's a high incidence of Alzheimer's in minority communities. So you're kind of fixing uh, in part this challenge and problem. Um, what more is on the horizon in terms of that? Are there things that other partners in this, in this effort should be doing along those lines as well? That's part one. Part two is you're one of the most politically savvy people I know. Is there a way, what I asked this of Representative Tonko earlier, what is the, the pathway? Is it legislation? Is it, is it uh, you know, changing the mind of you know, Anthony Becerra, uh, uh, Secretary Becerra? Is it, you know, what, what do we need to do by way of changing the CMS decision if, if, if that is um, something you're trying to do? 
Um, well, there's no question uh, that uh, if you put clinical trial sites uh, in communities of color, you're going to get more communities of color who have reasonable access to clinical trials. It's fairly logical. Uh, but what uh, the government has traditionally done is cited their trials in large academic centers, uh, tertiary hospitals, which are largely, you know, uh, in white uh, populated areas and high income areas. Uh, so that if you do clinical trials in the traditional government way through academic centers, uh, you're basically not going to get minority populations because they, right. they don't live there. They don't trust those centers. Uh, they're not anywhere near where they live uh, and they don't speak the language or look alike uh, the kinds of populations we need to attract. That's one of the pro additional problems of the CMS solution of right. doing additional clinical trials through uh, academic centers, uh, tertiary hospital centers, they're not going to solve the problem that way. There are other problems here because the comorbidities that tend to, if present, exclude someone from a clinical trial, hypertension, diabetes, those exclusion factors are, uh, those particular factors are of greater incidence in minority populations. So there is now an effort uh, with our organization and with NIH and with others to really go through uh, those exclusionary factors to identify the ones that are most barring minority populations from participation in clinical trials, even if they want to. Our clinical trial network called the Global Alzheimer's Platform has a national account with Lyft uh, so that right. if, in fact, people have transportation problems, uh, the clinical trial site will basically make the reservation, make sure that the car shows up, make sure that they, it, to, the, to the appointment that you've made and takes you home. So that, if, in fact, there are business practices, just plain hmm. old business practices right. that need to change in order to do this. And, On the and, government and, side, uh, mm -hmm. let me... You yeah. want to talk about the CMS decision just quickly? Yeah, I, I, and I just want to say, and, and of course, I meant Xavier Becerra, not as Anthony Becerra. It's been a marathon, <laughs> folks. So just a little correction. You obviously myself. have something in your ear. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is all me. I just did, I know this ain't oh, Anthony Becerra. Okay. Go, go right. ahead. Very impressive, then. Very impressive. Well, the first, uh, the CMS decision is a proposed decision. Uh, and they're going to come out with a final decision in two months. We hope they change their mind. Uh, that they cover these drugs to label so that everyone can have access so that we can actually, through a variety of techniques, uh, understand how these drugs work in real world populations, not in a, in a pristine, pure clinical trial population. Hmm. We're only going to know whether these drugs work and what kind of significant impact they might have if we study their real impact in real world populations. That means cover the drug to label uh, and uh, and and put in place evidence development techniques uh, that will in fact study uh, what the impact is in real world populations, both safety and efficacy. Those that have participated in the Biogen trials, about half of them will say, uh, as they've continued on that drug, uh, half of them say they've been held steady now for two mm. or three years in an earlier state of Alzheimer's, a much more functional state, and about half are not. But we don't really understand exactly why half of the population that gets these drugs mm. is, is uh, achieving some benefit and half do not. That is, when you average out the half the do and half the don't, you get what looks to the FDA or to some um, uh, uh, scientist as a marginal drug. Well, it's not marginal for half the population. It is marginal or worse, but for not, it may have mm. no impact on half the population. We've got to study that, understand it in real world settings. So it will be a change in a CMS, so CMS will have to review its decisions uh, with Xavier Becerra and then review it with the White House. And we'll hope that one of those levels of review uh, will make the determination to give widespread access uh, to, to these drugs, all four of them, uh, Biogen, Lilly, ASI, and Roche, uh, well, and make sure that we understand how we can benefit the population with wide access. Well, we'll certainly be watching that too. But George, I depend upon you to to, to message me when you hear stuff before I do um, on that. Uh, we are taking. I don't hear uh, anything before. I don't hear anything before you do, Steve. <laughs> We're going to uh, take a question from the audience from Maureen Desmond. Maureen. Hi, my name is Maureen Desmond, and I'm founder and president of Navigating Through Loss, where we help companies and their employees navigate through significant change and losses. My question for you today is, what are you finding as a means for support 
for the family caretakers of those diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Thank you. Let's get responses from all of you. Petra? Thank you for that question. Um, one of the things at Alzheimer's Los Angeles, we provide care counseling to for families and uh, family members. We provide mm -hmm. caregiver education, mm -hmm. as well as a variety of support groups for um, men and women, adult children, and so on. And we really uh, take the the role of the caregiver to heart. We understand the overwhelming task of one day, you know, just being a mom and or and wife, and the next day, mom, wife, caregiver, and the role and the duties that come along with that. So we appreciate that question. Thank you, Catherine. Your thoughts? We certainly need more of them. I think the work of organizations like <laughs> are critical here. Um, the other thing I would add is there's probably need for more conversation about entering that caregiver stage and what resources might be available, right? A lot more education and awareness um, and, and tangible resources that you can use so that you can be better prepared as well. That's great. And George, uh, last word with you. Well, uh, I think uh, that I just echo the last two comments. This is uh, basically done, you know, geographically loco located and basically uh, local organizations. Alzheimer's LA is terrific caring kind in New York, but uh, local Alzheimer's serving organizations uh, are central to this uh, particular role. Uh, and there's a new organization called uh, Voices of Alzheimer's, which is a small startup organization working with caring kind, which provides emotional support. This, these are existing dementia uh, uh, dyads, um, uh, that is both a caregiver and, and an individual with the disease who provide emotional support almost the day after you get diagnosed with Alzheimer's and you begin to go through the process of the anticipatory grief hmm. uh, of, of having a fatal disease. Uh, and they are emotional interventions, explaining hmm. what the process is going to be like, explaining what kind of resources will be needed. Uh, and so Jim and uh, Jerry uh, Taylor uh, do that and uh, started that organization called Voices of Alzheimer's and it is terrific. <laughs> Let me, let me just say as well to our, our questioner that um, I already know because we're going to show a pre-tape and a, you know, a tape I taped the conversation I had with Nanette Barragan, a rep, U.S. House of Representatives member from California, um, who's a caregiver to her mother uh, in this. And I think her answer to that question, which I get into, there's not nearly enough resources given to this. So, you know, but it's a very powerful interview coming up next. But I really want to thank all of you. Wonderful conversation. Uh, Petra Niles, gerontologist and senior manager of African American uh, Services uh, at Alzheimer's Los Angeles. Catherine Schubert, president and CEO of Society's, uh, Society for Women's Health Research. And George Vradenberg, chair and co-founder of Us Against Alzheimer's. Thank you all so much for joining me today. Thank you for having us. As I Thank mentioned you. just a moment ago earlier, I had a chance to speak with Congresswoman Nanette Barragan from California, who serves on the Energy and Commerce Health Subcommittee and whose mother is an Alzheimer's patient. And she is the, one of the caregivers. She is a principal caregiver on Sunday nights and Monday nights. Powerful story. Listen to it. Here's my conversation with the Congresswoman. Representative Barragan, thank you so much for joining us. This uh, topic is one that I, I feel every year I've been probably moderating for 30 years. And you know, in the United States of America, with all our resources, the advancements in science, this is one where I just feel like the faster we pedal, the further back we've gone. But I would love you to dissuade me from that, as I know this is an issue of Alzheimer's in America that you care very much about. Well, you know, Alzheimer's is a personal issue for me, and we know that Hispanic and Latinos face one and a half times greater risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. Um, so when you talk about my constituents, you talk about the American people, um, this is something that we need to get a grip and handle on in making sure we're providing resources to families and that we're helping uh, these new drugs and, um, you know, develop and not stand in the way, which is why I'm concerned about the CMS decision uh, that will require clinical trials to be conducted in hospital-based outpatient settings. You know, I think this is going to really limit the demographics of people who are going to have access to these drugs, people of color, low-income communities, people who live in rural areas. So um, I just uh, hope we can uh, continue to invest. Well, why don't we unpack that for a moment for our viewers who may not um, may not know um, all, all the, the decisions about CMS and how it impacts 
you know, a class of, of, of drug that they have decided to cover for those people in clinical trials, but not for those who are outside. It sort of divides the territory. Um, how, how much awareness is there among your colleagues of how divisive this could be? Well, we've, I've talked to some of my colleagues about it, and uh, certainly some of them who have uh, family members who have Alzheimer's. And there is, I think uh, there is a split. Um, but let me tell you, when I first read about this drug, um, and I took my own mother in to see her neurologist. The neurologist brought up the drug and talked about it. Unfortunately, my mother was too severe, too far along uh, mm -hmm. to get it. And then I later found out that CMS was not going to even allow somebody like my mother uh, to get access to it. Right. So CMS made this decision that um, really, I think, is going to have a negative implication on an entire class of drugs um, that can have positive impacts on Alzheimer's. Now, there hasn't been a lot of progress on Alzheimer's drugs for a long time. So when you see something promising, um, for me, I thought it was something to celebrate and something that people are gonna have access to. So I think that CMS should not include future promising amyloid Alzheimer's drug uh, within their coverage decision. Now, their decision severely restricts patient access to an entire class of drugs for Alzheimer's. And that means that patients and people um, who can pay out of pocket will have access, but others won't, will not. And but, so but, for me, it's an equity issue as well. Well, I think, you know, and, and very happy you laid that out, but I think in addition to the preponderance or sort of the in, in unequal prevalence of Alzheimer's in, you know, across uh, different groups in society, but nonetheless, uh, baby boomers are retiring. We're going to see more and more Alzheimer's in America. And, and really, there are two rivers that have to swim together. One is the scientific research and the development of therapies, cures, and approaches um, that we're discussing a lot today and completely uh, supportive of that. But the other side is, um, I don't know how to frame it, but really, it's the, the reality that people are going to need care, uh, caregivers, who are full-time workers. We've seen this already through COVID, but you know, an ongoing um, burden or responsibility, depending on how you wanna frame it, is gonna be part of this country more and more. Are we doing what we can for that side of the equation in, in, in addition to the scientific support side of this track? Not enough. Um, and you know, women, and primarily women in families end up being the caregivers um, we've seen a huge uh, number of uh, Hispanic and Latino women being those who have to step up. Um, now, you mentioned the scientific side, and you know that's one side of this, but we're talking about families who have to care for patients with Alzheimer's. And uh, in some situations, um, many, many people are unpaid. Now, one, we need to invest more in in-home care. There's a home-based community uh, program that Build Back Better actually provides funding to help expand. That would help families provide um, care. Now, we also led on a letter, me and uh, some members of the California delegation, to allow um, in-home care to have family members, a qualifying family members, provide the care and actually be paid under this federal program. And so there's been some progress on that front, but we need more access to the program. Uh, we need resources uh, for families who are providing the care, like training, what to expect. Um, there is a bill out there called the Alzheimer's Caregiver Support Act, um, which would help provide some of that training and support services. Um, but there's really a lot to unpack and a lot of uncertainty around Alzheimer's, in addition to making sure we do everything we can mm. to have early diagnosis. Um. I don't know how to frame this right, but among your constituents, um, what is when, when they find that they have a family member, as you did, as you found in your own family, suffering from Alzheimer's, what is their, I, I hate to call it literacy rate, but what is their awareness of resources, who to reach out to, how to find community? You know, for folks I know um, who have Alzheimer's um, among one of their loved family members, it is a beginning uh, at the front end of a lonely and frustrating journey. Uh, and, and I know there are resources and networks out there and we're interviewing some of them in today's program. Uh, and I'm very good, grateful they're all here. But I'd just be interested as you talk um, uh, in part to the Hispanic community, what, what is the level of connection and community there around Alzheimer's? 
Well, I think that's still a lot of education needs to happen and uh, people don't know what to expect. Um, it still happens to me. Uh, I'll see something where my mother is declining more and I ask myself, is this normal? Is this not normal? Mm -hmm. And I had to do research myself to find out the organizations that can help you, um, you know, prepare yourself. And it's really hard to see a loved one um, like that. So um, we have to do a better job of telling people about the resources. I didn't even know about the federal in-home care program, the waiver program. It was not until a year and a half ago that I learned about it. And I was a member of Congress for years before that. So I think right. it's making sure people know about programs, people know what kind of books they could read to expect, um, making sure there's a support system um, and, uh, and that the training is there, but also the availability of caregivers, which we know right now there's a huge shortage. I myself am a caregiver Sunday nights and Monday nights because I don't have mm. a caregiver for those nights because of the shortage. So I think investing in people and the human infrastructure is so key. Well, that was my next question to you really is, you know, I know you are one of your mom's caregivers and how do you do it? I mean, you're a representative in Congress. I, I mean, I, I, I know that other people have jobs, full-time jobs and manage this as well, but I mean, can you give us some insights as to how you juggle it? It's a real challenge, um, especially because of the caregiver situation. You know, I've been lucky in that we have proxy voting right now in Congress. Um, so if I have to fly in on a red eye on a Monday so that I can do the Sunday coverage and then try to get help on Monday, sometimes I can't find that coverage. So I will have to stay at home and care for my mom Sunday nights and Monday nights and then head to D.C. And so it's a uh, it's a real concern. And as you mentioned, um, I'm one of many people this is happening to. And so we need resources and the ability to be able to provide care. And we know that population is growing of people who are going to be impacted by Alzheimer's. The other thing I want to mention quickly, something I recently learned about and didn't know talking about education is this tie in connection of high blood sugar to Alzheimer's and dementia, something I was not aware of. And if you take a look at the Hispanic Latino community, we already have high diabetes rates. So I think there's a lot of areas where education needs to happen. Um, and I'll be the first to admit, I'm still learning myself. You know, I think, you know, one of the interesting things, if we use you as a benchmark for a member of Congress, I've also interviewed uh, folks like, you know, Diana DeGette, Representative DeGette, and, and Fred Upton, who are celebrated by many Republicans and Democrats for their Cures 2.0 uh, Act and kind of trying to push, you know, bipartisan work around investment in science for the kinds of maladies we're discussing today. You know, and I know this is kind of asking for your gut feeling, but when it comes to what Congress is doing proactively and constructively. I, I just wonder, because I'm not aware, is it enough? Are we going in the right direction? Are we tilting the right way? What sort of scale do we need to achieve that we don't have? So when it comes to science, NIH, medical research partnerships, what's your gut feeling? Are we where are, are we, you know, where we should be, or or do we need to to seriously upscale those investments? I think we need to upscale the investments. I mean, look, this is a public health crisis and we're seeing the numbers and the the, the impact it's having on our healthcare system is going to be huge and costly, right? As a member of the House Energy and Commerce Committee and its health subcommittee, I'm committed to tackling this problem. Now, I am proud to say ENC recently held a hearing about establishing the Advanced Research Projects Agency for Health. So this new agency would be solely dedicated to accelerating the pace of scientific breakthroughs for diseases such as ALS and Alzheimer's and cancer. And the bill dedicates $3 billion annually to provide much needed research to discover a cure for Alzheimer's. But it's an investment in a cure, but it's also an investment in people, caregiving, and we need to prepare ourselves because this is, uh, this is only growing. And um, when we see promising drugs, we need to make sure they're accessible and we're not blocking their ability to make that progress. Just finally, you know, the president recently, President Biden recently, uh, resurrected and sort of pushed reset on his cancer moonshot efforts to expedite uh, cancer research to sort of de-silo a lot of the cancer research community and bring dissimilar parts of the research community together. Do we need something like a White House conference on Alzheimer's? Do we need the, the power of the president to bring together a lot of the research community, the advocates uh, in that space, patients, 
caregivers. Um, but, but you know, I would also say very importantly, the scientific community into a White House conference on Alzheimer's. I don't know if there's any chatter about that. This is just my own view that, I, you know, I sort of think I've been doing this for 20 years and I haven't seen one. So why not have one? Right. Well, I'm with you. Why not have one? And I wholeheartedly support it and a, a good bug in the ear to put of, uh, to the White House. Um, the reality is that when you talk to folks is that there's a lot of health issues and, and it's hard to pick and choose. Um, but, you know, one of the things that we are I was excited to see is that the House um, fiscal year 2022 appropriations bill included about three point four billion dollars, which was an increase of 200 million above the uh, the 2021 level for Alzheimer's disease and related dementias research at NIH. So there's some progress, but we we've got to tackle this um, in a in a huge way. And so I would welcome um, that level of um, heightened awareness and, and action. We need action and people are you know, desperate to find something to slow this down or to cure down all cure Alzheimer's and its impacts on our families and our loved ones. Well, I'm sure our viewers and I uh, very much value you. You're sharing your lived experience, uh, but also what's going on in the policy space for this. Representative Nanette Barragan, uh, Democrat from California. She is a member of the House Committee on Energy uh, and Commerce and the Health Subcommittee there. She's also uh, perhaps very relevant today, a member of the Congressional Task Force on Alzheimer's Disease. Thank you so much for sharing um, your thoughts with us. Thank you, Steve. Wow, what a great conversation. Thanks again to Congresswoman Nanette Barragan for joining me. I look forward to talking to her more about some of these ideas she mentioned. That brings us to the end of our program today. What a great day. Big thank you to Eli Lilly for its support and all of you attendees for hanging with us through these many conversations. I thought it was worth it. I hope you did it too, as well. Please share today's videos, which will be posted on our website shortly with your friends, your family, people who care. Uh, this is important stuff, folks. I'm Steve Clemens. Be well.